All right. So, um, yeah. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about borderline personality disorder. And um, this is something I know a little bit about. Um, this actually represents a clinical population I have, I have uh, worked with. And also, this is this really essentially the subject of my, my, um, my second dissertation, which turned into a book um, uh, about drug addiction. Because, you know, in the book, I make the case that drug addicts uh, can essentially be thought of as having personality disorders and essentially can be thought of as having borderline personality disorder. Um, borderline personality disorder is uh, sort of the, how should I put this, sort of the flagship personality disorder. So um, this is, it's almost like if somebody has like diffuse personality disorder symptoms, especially if they have, you know, the very common symptom, very common defenses of splitting and dissociation, those kind of things. Um, it's a typical diagnosis. So a lot of people get diagnosed with this. Um, and so you'll see a lot of it everywhere. Um, you are likely to see somebody diagnosed with this in your practice, probably. And um, you will know it when you encounter it because um, people with severe, especially severe borderline personality disorder, are very difficult to work with. Right. Not that they, uh, you can't work with them. We're going to talk about that. You can work with them. Um, there's been a lot of um, progress in the psychodynamic world. Uh, in dealing with uh, uh, personality disorders, and especially borderline personality disorders. So a lot of time when you read the psychodynamic literature, you know, they'll talk about personality disorders in general, but really they're sort of start focusing in on borderline personality disorder. And there's a reason for that. And I'm going to show you the reason for that a little bit, because the underlying psychodynamics are pretty similar. You know, remember we talked about levels of organization, right? So we have sort of neurotic level, we have sort of a narcissistic level, we have a borderline level and we have a psychotic level. Well, the borderline level is sort of a lot of personality disorders, people with personality disorders function at the borderline level because the psychodynamics are really similar. And the narcissistic personality organization level is very similar. Some people include the narciss narcissism, NPD, in the borderline personality organization. Some people split it off to make it different because it's slightly more organized you know, the personality is slightly more organized than the, uh, than the borderline. But you can think of them, you know, NPD is in the borderline, or you can think of it as a little bit separate. Uh, but personality disorders fall within this sort of level of organization, of personality organization. Okay? And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm going to show you some more diagrams later on, and that will hopefully make that a little bit clearer. Okay? So I thought I would give you a little uh, a little graphics here um, because you know why not? And here's the graphics: the all good angels and the all evil skeletons here. This this sort of graphic, sort of in a nutshell, will explain a lot about what it's like to deal with people with borderline personality disorder who employ the splitting defense. Um, and then I thought I would give a quote from a book because, of course. Um, uh, in TV shows and in um, movies and in literature, you'll see a lot of echoes of borderline personality disorder. And I'm sure if you all sat here for a second, you could think of a TV show that had somebody who had the symptoms of borderline personality disorder. Not including reality TV, because in reality TV, they pick people with this because they make create lots of drama. Remember Cluster B, the dramatic, you know, things they pick histrionic people and antisocial people. You know, because that makes for good TV. But but in scripted TV, in movies, you will see a lot of depictions of people who are, you know, would maybe be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, or who have not. They're not diagnosable if they have borderline personality disorder traits. Okay, and remember, we're talking about a spectrum here, from very mild, having just some traits, but being roughly normal, to being really severely having a real severe pathology. Um, you know, at the other end. Okay. Um, so I have my favorite uh, borderline personality disorder character in the show. Anybody watch the new version of Lost in Space? You seen that? It's uh, it, it, it's they they it was a show from the 1960s. It was kind of campy, and they did a re re remake a couple of years ago, which is very like serious science fiction show. And one of my favorite actresses, Parker Posey, plays Doctor Smith, kind of evil Doctor Smith, and she 
portrays somebody who is very borderline, you know, that flips back and forth between good and bad. And so again, if you look around, just pick your favorite shows or your favorite movie, and you, you can sometimes find a character. But I, I gave you a quote here. Uh, good and evil are so close as to be chained together in the soul, which comes from Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote the book Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So a whole book about where he literally, he literally splits into good and evil, right? The whole book about splitting, right? Written in 1886. You know, so people even back in the day were thinking about, um, you know, personalities having, you know, good parts and bad parts, these kind of things. And, you know, near, near the twain shall meet. Um, that kind of thing. So again, you know, it's, it's an idea that has been sort of floating around out there. Okay, so let's just talk about the the, the main um, the main uh, uh, aspects of borderline personality. Sort of get this out of the way. Um, this is just out of the DSM. Um, uh, this is a generalized pattern of instability in interpersonal relationships, self-image, observable emotions, and significant impulsiveness. Pattern begins by early childhood and occurs in various contexts. Begins by early or, or by early adulthood, but I would say now we're also seeing signs of this in children. And of course, the genesis of the disorder is in early childhood. And even though I have friends who uh, are psychologists who say that's not true, that only it starts in adolescence, you know, um, I, if you look at the research literature, which I will show you some in a second, um, the research literature, even the non-psychodynamic research literature is saying the stuff that these personality disorders are starting in childhood, okay, early childhood, early, early, early childhood. So, um, if anybody tells you otherwise, they're just wrong about that. These these things have their genesis much earlier on. Okay. All right. Uh, and occurs in various contexts. It's indicated by five or more of the following. One, frantic efforts, excluding suicide or self-inflicted cuts or burns to avoid real or imagined abandonment. A pattern of intense, unstable interpersonal relationships that may quickly alternate between extremes of idealization and um, where the other person's kind of put in a pedestal and devaluation where the other person's negative qualities are now exaggerated. This is the splitting, you see. Uh, identity disturbance, sudden dramatic shifts in self-image in terms of shifting values, sexual identity, types of friends, vocational goals, impulsiveness in at least two areas are potentially harmful, spending, sex, substance abuse, reckless driving, binge eating, um, etc., ex excluding suicidal or self-mutilating behavior, repeated suicidal behavior, threats, or self-inflicted cuts or burns, self-harm, self-mutilating behavior, uh, significant uh, sudden changes of mood and observable emotion, intense periodic sadness, irritability, or anxiety, usually lasting a few hours, rarely lasting more than a few days, extreme reactivity to interpersonal stresses, chronic feelings of emptiness and boredom, inappropriate and intense anger or difficulty controlling anger and temporary stress-related psychosis sometimes uh, and symptoms as paranoia and grossly distorted body image. Okay. So even from reading this, you probably get the idea of lots of disorders that may be what we call borderline personality disorder adjacent, very similar, you know, eating disorders, substance abuse disorders. Okay. So my book, my, my second dissertation was about how um, people with substance abuse, you know, really real addicts, not people who just try drugs and then, okay, that was enough, but people who feel com compelled, they have a compulsion to use drugs, how their underlying psychodynamics were very similar to borderline personality disorder. Okay? So again, lots of other sort of adjacent things to this. Uh, evolutionary explanations, and of course, um, again, this is where my, um, you know, where I... I try to uh, think about this in, in terms of all these disorders. And I think, um, and I got a typo there, oops. Sorry about that. Uh, board, uh, so a possible explanation for borderline personality disorder is it represents an extreme of an adaptive mechanism related to environmental contingencies, okay? And Darwin even, uh, Charles Darwin uh, even wrote that emotions play very important roles in regulating social functioning. So emotions and social functioning are, are very much related to one another, okay? And so um, it's not surprising in something like borderline personality disorder that you would have both emotional and emotional regulation issues and social functioning issues. Okay? And emotional expression uh, is, ex is based on early experience and modeled from parents. And this is a new word for you, heterosis. 
heterosis, 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 which means the adaptive use of abnormal traits. That's a good word to be thinking about. And this may increase fitness, genetic fitness in certain circumstances. This can occur as long as the deviant traits do not interfere with reproduction. Okay. Now, while severe borderline personality disorder, and I also mentioned here, you know, for the next lecture, the pre-stage antisocial personality disorder, um, lead to greater risk of early mortality through risky behaviors and suicide, less severe borderline personality disorder, and especially having some borderline personality disorder traits might prove to have evolutionary advantage in specific circumstances, okay? Um, and the problematic interpersonal functioning in borderline personality disorder can be useful in competitive and traumatic environments. This can be thought of as a live hard, die young strategy, okay? And um, let's see. Um, so in traumatic environments, such as in wartime or society where physical or sexual abuse or serious violence or neglect, of, especially of children, is rampant, the impulsivity of borderline personality disorder, and again, I'm typo, I was typing this, I must have typed this late at night. Uh, the, the, these, these traits may enhance survival because they facilitate quick decision-making uh, in the action in the face of threats. In other words, if you're really impulsive, you know, and you're faced with a threat, you make a quick decision to do something, right? Uh, maybe you're in an environment where it's just, there's violence that's going on all, all the time. Maybe the ability to dissociate a little bit is helpful, right? Maybe the ability for your emotions to switch from being happy to being super angry, you know, allows you to defend yourself better. So these are all things, these are all traits that may be things that actually confer some survival value. And so they persist in the, in the, uh, in the population, in the human population. Okay. Now, the problem is, again, if you get too many of these traits and your environment that sort of triggers them, like your early childhood is, is like a wartime, you know, abusive early childhood, and you have all these genetically predisposed to these traits and it triggers them, then you end up manifesting these traits. Maybe your brain gets wired, you know, to express those traits, but then you grow up and you're in, in, in an environment, in a society where it's not violent, it's not super traumatic. And suddenly, the way your brain is wired does not fit with the society that you're in. You know, the society of your early childhood may be like wartime, may be abusive. Your brain gets wired to deal with that. But then when you grow up, you're now in a society that's not like that. And so there's a mismatch, right? And so then we label this borderline personality disorder and we'll say you need to get therapy or get some help, right? So that's an evolutionary way to think about this. Does that make sense? And, and I would really encourage all of you guys to think about most of the disorders you're going to study in your career from an evolutionary standpoint, especially the ones that are very common. Because a lot of times when we see things that are very common showing up a lot of places, um, this can be a signal that there may be something biologically, you know, underpinning it, you know, evolutionarily underpinning it. So it's, it, I think it's worth thinking about. Um, and this is also worth thinking about, too, when we think about, you know, what's going on in the war, you know, wars and places, you know, we can think about what's going on in Ukraine right now, right? And it would be an interesting study, a longitudinal study, to see if after the war in Ukraine, you know, the generation of children that are raised, you know, during that war time, if we have a higher incidence of borderline personality disorder. Um, I mean, I think if the money and the wherewithal is out there to do these kind of studies, we could be doing these kind of things. But even an ex post facto study, looking at rates of borderline personality disorder, and then looking at, you know, where kids grew up in this very war-torn place, um, we could find, uh, see if there's some evidence for this. But I think, I think it, it, in general, it, it makes sense, okay? Um, okay. Uh, and I think that basically that's what I said here. Uh, also, you know, we can think of we can think of how this stuff, you know, these traits, and the evolution function in a biological way. And we're, I'm going to try to have a whole separate lecture on personality, the neurobiology of personality disorders, which a lot of that will be borderline personality because that's probably one of the things that's been most studied. So I want to have a separate lecture for that. So I'm not going to go too much into the neurobiology of these things yet. I want to save that and put that all in one lecture. Hopefully I'm working on that now, uh, but I do want to mention a little bit about um, some biology with borderline personality disorder because um, it, it relates to this evolutionary thing. And you can imagine when a child experiences a traumatic environment, inherited borderline 
traits become active and become wired in neurological functioning. So this is something that's been studied a little bit. And they found that traumatic separation specifically can be a hyper response, cause a hyper response to cortisol, which is the stress hormone related to fight or flight, as well as the subsequent release of oxytocin and vasopressin. Okay. Vasopressin is something that makes you retain water and it does things with the kidneys. It also kind of like a stress reaction. And oxytocin is something that, you know, allows you to bond with other people, but also has other things. Um, and with, what they found is if attachment is not restored, the person doesn't, you know, they, 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 they experience this traumatic separation and then they're not reattached. They don't attach back to somebody. You know, the parent doesn't come back or whatever. Uh, this leads to an intense aggression, fight or flight response, uh, which is alter, which alternates with a normal relaxed state. So it almost, almost in a way, think of this, what we're finding with these kind of studies is the, the splitting uh, aspect of defense is almost physiological. Like there's almost a physiological, you go, they go into a fight or flight mode and then they go into more relaxed mode. They alternate back and forth. It's almost like splitting has a biological substrate a little bit uh, in borderline personality disorder. So again, that was something that, you know, somebody wanted to do a really cool dissertation, that would be something really interesting to look at. You know, you could actually find some people with borderline personality disorder and, you know, you could measure cortisol and these other kinds of things. And, you know, um, that would be very interesting. And questions about this stuff. The neurobiology is really interesting. And again, Borderline personality disorder, we're going to find more because there's been more studies on this about the neurobiology and also antisocial personality disorder. Those are the two that there's been a lot of uh, neurobiology uh, work on. And so we'll talk about those in a couple of weeks. I'm going to save all that stuff, try to lump it all together. All right. And this is a diagram basically showing you the what I just said. Basically, you have genetics, you know, here and genetics, and also you have these monoamine neuropeptides like uh, stress hormones, cortisol, other things, you know, and, you, and these affect your epigenetics, right? Remember I talked about epigenetics? This is the programming. So the genetics are the hardware and the epigenetics is the operating system that runs on the hardware, right? The epigenetics can be affected by, you know, genetic things and, and things, but they also can be affected by environment, Par parental caregiving style, abuse, neglect, other trauma can affect Epigenetics by shutting off, turning on various uh, various genes, okay? allowing those things to be expressed or inhibiting their expression. Very, very important. Um, this area, epigenetics, of course, is going to be a huge area in the future of psychology and clinical psychology. So it really behooves you all to learn something about epigenetics and um, how how that occurs. And again, if you take my class on schizophrenia, I will go into some detail about that. They talk about it with schizophrenia. Um, this stuff all leads to insecure attachment. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going a lot of detail into attachment theory in this class. It is a psychodynamic theory. Uh, I'm sure some of you probably know more about it than I do. It's not my area of expertise, but I will mention attachment theory. And, of course, in a lot of personality disorders, especially borderline personality disorders, uh, people can be seen as having insecure attachment. And also leads to intracyclic pain. And this also relates to opioid oxytocin dysregulation. So the idea is that you produce your own opioids in your body um, and you produce oxytocin, which is another thing that's sort of socially bonding kind of uh, hormone here. And this gets dysregulated. And this causes interpersonal stress, rejection, abandonment, and it leads to all sorts of hyperreactivity, distress, and other kinds of impairments. It leads to empathic dysfunction and borderline symptoms, which then feeds back into this and becomes a feedback loop. Okay. So this is sort of a biological way of, 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 of thinking about this. Okay. Now, in a more poetic sense, I got another quote from uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which I think also explains this pretty well. Um, I thought I'd read this to you. The most racking of pain succeeded, a grinding in the bones, deadly nausea, and a horror of the spirit that could not be exceeded at the hour of birth and death. Then these agonies began swiftly to subside, and they came to myself, as if out of a great sickness, there was something strange in my sensations, something indescribably sweet. I felt younger, lighter, happier in body. Within, I was conscious of heady recklessness, a current of disordered sensual images running like a mill race in my fancy, a solution to the bonds of obligation, unknown but innocent freedom of soul. I knew myself at the first breath of this new life, more wicked 
kinfold loyalty, sold a slave to my original evil and thought in that moment, grace and delighted me like wine. So again, he's talking about the light of feeling like you know, letting go of all of these sort of inhibitory things and then feeling, you know, both evil, bad and evil, and at the same time feeling sort of, you know, like he's freed of his inhibition, right? So again, there may be a biological substrate to that sort of thing. Yes. So is that saying that there is just looking at the oxytocin because of the back and forth of the parent, the oxytocin gets dysregulated, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and then like biologically in a way that carries over, and that's where the attachment issues happen. The attachment issues happen first. Okay. And then, well, imagine. So, how many people here have a pet, a dog or a cat? Oh, good. It's a good crowd. So, what happens when you pick up your pet and you hold it? Right. What happens in your body? What does your body do? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you produce oxytocin. And by the way, I think there's some research, actually, at least in dogs. I think the dogs also produce oxytocin. And so this is a bonding hormone, right? This is how you bond. It does other things too. It helps you con like contractions when you're pregnant and having the baby, you know. But I mean, it, it is a bonding hormone, right? So imagine if you're a child and you're in this, you have these abusive parents and you're not getting that holding. You know, you're you're going to get uh, dysregulation of that oxytocin. And the other one, the opioids. What are the what are the uh, opioids in the body that you produce? Endorphins. Endorphins, right? So endorphins, other things. Endorphins, when you feel good, right? So again, you know, picking up your pet. You know, those of you who are parents, you know, if you have a little child, you pick up your child. You know, you feel pleasure, right? This is something that is wired into us to feel pleasure and attachment because why? It has. It has survival value. There are animals like reptiles and stuff. They just lay their eggs and then, you know, babies come out, you know, and they just take off. They don't care. There's not, in, in those animals, the survival value is to have, usually it's to have lots of offspring, right? So fish will just release, you know, eggs and sperm in the water, you know, like literally thousands of, you know, eggs and thousands of sperm in the water and they'll mix up and, you know, maybe babies will form and maybe they won't and the parents you know, swim away, right? That's another evolutionary strategy, right? So there's all these evolutionary strategies for for survival, right? And so and there's everything in between those fish that lay, you know, lay eggs and the babies come out and the males put them in their mouth and carry them, you know, and there's all sorts of really weird things out there. But there's these strategies. The strategies for mammals tend to be that you, you form attachments, right? Because if you form attachments, if you're there, especially in human beings, why? Why in human beings is this especially important? How long is your child going to be need you to help them? Forever. Forever. Well, my, <laughs> mine's almost 21 now, and I'm still, you know, supporting, you know, there's, so and I'm sure your parents or some of you guys, your parents are still, you know, helping you out, you know, I mean, so it, there's a long, it, there's a long road to maturity for humans, right? It takes a long time. They need a lot of parental support. If you don't have that attachment, that's not going to work. And if you think of the environment where human beings evolved in, you know, living out in the savannah in Africa, you know, where, you know, there's, there's, um, there's, uh, you know, threats from places coming in, you know, animals attaching you. If you're not secure, you don't care about the kid. You just leave them out, leave them there. I'm going to go out and do something. Well, you come back, the kid's been eaten by a lion or something, right? You know, or whatever was around there, saber tooth tiger, or whatever was around at that time, right? So this attachment is something that, that prevents that from happening. And so it has survival value, right? And again, there's all sorts of things like, I mean, evolution is really fascinating. Um, you know, the other, other thing is, you know, you can ask, you know, why do, uh, this is this is a little controversial, but a lot of people think this is true. You know, why, why do we have orgasms, right? Why is sex pleasurable, right? Because if it's not, you're just gonna, you know, done, go away, right? But if it's pleasurable and it keeps you coming back, why do human beings have sex not just for reproduction? Because it's pleasurable. Why is it pleasurable? Because it keeps the people together. And if you have two parents together, then you know it's, it makes it easier to watch that kid who's taking him take 18 years to like you know mature, right? So it's something one of the theories is that it keeps the parents together, right? Keeps the the, the pair bonding happens. Again, it also requires secure attachment, right? So this not only this also relates to you know your ability to to relate to other people, right? So very, very important. So when that goes awry, all sorts of things can happen, okay? So yeah, so this is this is an evolutionary thing. And again, it has, I think very clearly has evolutionary, you know, attachment, secure attachment 
And he clearly has evolutionary um, uh, fitness, confers evolutionary fitness. When would it not confer, when would it not confer evolutionary fitness or when would secure insecure attachment be useful? Right. This is the theory about where borderline traits come up. It may be useful in places where they're extremely violent, where there's war torn, where there's a lot of chaos going on. And in that way, you know, insecure attachment, you can just like, uh, you know, you know, you can develop these borderline traits, which will allow you to, you know, make quick decisions, to, to quickly be angry and defend yourself, you know, and be able to associate a little bit from whatever bad things going on. And those then later on may help you to survive long enough that you can have offspring. And so those traits remain in the, in the genetic pool, human genetic pool. Does that make sense? Yeah. This stuff, I love this stuff. I mean, I, I really think of myself first and foremost as an evolutionary psychologist underneath all this. That's why I like psychodynamic psychology because it's very evolutionary. You know, Freud was a big, really loved Darwin. He, you know, he, you know Freud's stuff, is the Darwin of you know the old stuff? Now we know a lot more about evolution. We can we can fill in some blanks and everything. So I think this stuff is really really fascinating. And again, I would encourage you to think about all all disorders that you're studying as clinical psychologists in this way, um, because I do think, and this is a little I'm going a little tangent here, but I do think this is a good way to be thinking about um, you know new treatments for things, right? Um, and again, this these treatments could be uh, drug treatments, they could be, um, you know, like like oxytocin, for instance, this is something that they've been trying with, I believe they've been trying uh, to treat schizophrenic people with oxytocin, you know, or people who have social withdrawal and severe social withdrawal, give them some oxytocin, and, you know, maybe they'll form better attachments, you know, try to fix this dysregulation that's the target for therapy, right? So there could be drug therapies, there could be psychotherapies, um, the stuff could inform those kinds of things. So I encourage you to think about that. Right. Questions about this? Does it make sense? Yeah. I mean, my, my undergrad degree is in biology too. That's the other thing. And I, I went to a school where evolutionary theory was, um, uh, was taught and very important. And actually some people that in the program I was in were very famous evolutionary psychologists, even though I didn't get to take a class from him. Uh, Robert Triggers, who's a... Um, uh, uh, very famous uh, um, evolutionary psychologist, did a lot of studies on animals, um, was at the program I was at. So he had a lot of influence, even though unfortunately I never got to take a class from him. Interesting guy, by the way, side story. Wine, but we'll talk about that later. All right. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about prevalence. And here we are going into the weeds because the prevalence of borderline personality disorder is all over the map. And it will be all sorts of different things depending on who you look at and what research study you look at. So prepping for this lecture, I looked at, I don't know, four or five, uh, tried to look at recent stuff that was done. And again, I put some links, you know, some citations here. So, so you know, I'm not, you know, making this up. Uh, but the, um, and this is unfortunately, it's got in the way here of a slide. Um, so I have to do this. Uh, we're talking about the, 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 the reported prevalence goes anywhere from 0.5% of the population to around 6% of the general population. And 6% in some studies that include three or four symptoms. Other studies it included more than that. Um, this is in the general population. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's, that's not, the most prevalent of the personality disorders. What's the most prevalent one I talked about the other week? That will be a test question in the future for the next class. <laughs> Which are the most prevalent? No. no. Cluster C are the most prevalent. Didn't I say that? I think that's right. The cluster C ones are the most prevalent. Didn't I say that? I'll look at my notes. Not the most, B BPD is not the most prevalent. Okay? Uh, however, if you look at the inpatient population, people who show up at hospitals or clinics, now the number jumps up anywhere from 12 to 22%. And this tells you something about borderline personality disorder. These are people who are very likely to show up in clinics. Are you likely to show up in the hospital? Suicide attempts, you know, having a freak out, uh, you know, all sorts of things. Um, 
What they're not likely to show up in the hospital for, very interestingly enough, is psychotic breaks. And some people with more severe borderline personality disorder can have um, uh, short psychotic breaks. Usually they'll do it in your session. And usually by the end of the session, they'll pull themselves out of it. They, and, and all you have to do is say, let's go to the hospital and they will you know, suddenly not be psychotic anymore. Um, they, they typically do not get sent to the hospital for psychotic stuff. If the person maintains their psychosis for a while, even after the session, then you may think that they've got something else going on besides Florida. They may be psychotic right? or schizotypal or something. Is that because it's just so common in their everyday life? Not like an no, it's just something that is just been, I think it's just been noticed um, that a lot of times, you know, they won't go to the hospital, they won't be hospitalized for psychotic, you know, episodes. Um, but they will sometimes have short, and by short, I mean like within an hour, within the yeah. therapy hour. So I had a client, a patient that um, she would do that when she was under stress. She would, especially if I said something, I interpreted something to her that was stressful. She would have a little short psychotic break. And I would say, you know, for a few minutes, let's let her do her thing. And a few minutes I'd say, well, you know, maybe, you know, the hour's almost up and maybe we need to, maybe we need to take you to the hospital. And she, oh no, she pulled herself out. You know, it's really and not she wasn't like faking it either, you know. I mean she really dissociated, you know, like the point of you know like, pull the stuff out of it. No, I'm not going to the hospital. You know, okay, you know, you're not suicidal, are you? No, okay. So I mean that's you know it's an interesting um phenomenon. So this 12 to 22 percent, a lot of this is people going in for suicide attempts, things like that, or other things. Other, other physical ailments they might feel they have, uh, body hallucinations can be some anorexia, you know, all sorts of things can, can go on, uh, substance abuse problems, these kind of things. Okay? So a lot of people going into hospitals, if you work in an emergency room, you will definitely see some people with borderline personality disorder. Right? Uh, it's also now been reported to be present in about 3.2% of children, so we're now diagnosing this in, 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 in young people, um, which didn't used to really happen before as much. Now we're seeing that. Um, in a French high school, looking at a French high school in Canada, uh, they found about 10% of boys and 18% of girls uh, could have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. This one I take with a little grain of salt because, you know, we know in one of the differential diagnoses for BPD is adolescence, because a lot of times adolescents just normally will do a lot of things that people with borderline personality disorder will do. Um, and so that's that's something you have to look at if you're diagnosing somebody in you know, school age, kind of adolescent person, whether or not they're just, this is just a normal adolescence or whether or not it's it's they have a BPD kind of thing going on. So this, I think this number, these numbers may be a little bit I'm just guessing about that. Um, heredity, 50% uh, heritability has been reported with monozygotic twins. In other words, if one twin uh, had uh, BPD out of twins that, you know, uh, you know, identical twins, you know, about half of them, if one had BPD, the other one will have half, uh, have BPD, okay? Um, some other studies say that the disorder itself, BPD is not heritable. And this is the, 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 what I've always been led to understand, that the constellation of the things is not heritable, but the, but the traits are heritable, okay? So the traits are on. So if you think of doing, this is where it's interesting, because you think about doing family studies, right? You're studying twins or whatever. You know, if you can study those twins being in, and the study here didn't, I didn't think it outlined this, but if, you, if the twins have been, you know, the, 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 the sine qua non of, of uh, studies is where you have twins, right? They're genetically identical, but they're in different families, right? Mm -hmm. If they're in the same family, you know, we know that a lot of times if you have a, you know, it's the parenting, the early caregiving, you know, something that activates these borderline symptoms. If those twins are in the same family, you know, yeah, if one gets borderline, the other one's probably going to get it too, right? Because they're both experiencing not only the same genetics, but the same environment. So the twins, so I assume these twin studies were done in separate ones, but I have to look at that study. It's one of these down here um, carefully. I would, I would want to know about that for sure. Um, but so I like to think that the traits are something that are heritable and that the environment triggers triggers the disorder. That's my thinking about it. Um, there may be, maybe that's not quite true. Maybe, maybe it can just be completely genetic. 
I think most people don't really believe that's the case. And again, when you look at um, when you look at BPD and you look at people uh, people's uh, childhood background, inevitably there is some uh, problems in their in their early childhood, and there's some problems with the with the with the caregiver. Okay? Uh, BPD was found to be diagnosable in 34% of mothers involved in youth protection services. In other words, mothers who you know had to go to child protection services or child protection services did some sort of um, check on them. 34% uh, were found to have BPD. And of those mothers, 50% had had uh, had been involved with uh, child protective services in their childhood. If somebody called child protective services on their parents, right, and gives you some possibility indication of the intergenerational transmissibility of BPD, not through genetics, but through through a family environment. Okay? And there is some association of people having BPD that their parents their mothering parent, uh, but parents may have had BPD. Okay. Uh, there's a strong association of BPD with major depressive disorder. And back in the day, if you read the Broken Structures book, which I hope you guys looked at, um, there's a lot of history of thinking that um, BPD at one point was just a variation of a major depressive disorder. Okay. And there's some studies of looking at the underlying neurobiology of these things, and there's some overlap there. Okay, and there's a uh, with major depressive disorder. There's overlap with bipolar disorder. I'll talk about that in a little bit, some more. Um, so, you know, there may be some brain stuff going on there. I'm going to try to tease some of that out. And when I do the neurobiology lecture, I will hopefully find something to show you guys um, about that. Uh, I'm looking at that now. So, uh, in Australia, 6.3% 6 6 of suicides. Uh, were uh, were people who had a diagnosis of BPD, and 2.5% uh, additional cases, it, it was suspected the person had BPD. And, and compare this with suicide among other personality disorders was about 0.5%. So we see a lot of more suicide with uh, BPD than we do with other personality disorders. Okay. Uh, Environment, about 70% of BPD uh, report uh, childhood trauma and maltreatment, primarily physical, sexual abuse uh, and neglect. Um, I'm gonna guess that that's an underreported number. I would guess it's much higher than that. Um, but, you know, imagine, you know, if you have to report this kind of thing, you know, childhood trauma, um, first of all, there's dissociation from it. There's not being able to recall it. Uh, there's also not wanting to share that. Though I will tell you, uh, my experience, you know, doing therapy with people with BPD is that they will tend to overshare. Um, you know, you, the, the first session they will they will just tell you everything. You know, send someone inappropriately before they really get to know you. And so, you know, you know, maybe that seventy percent is correct. I think that's an under 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 statement. Um, and and in my in my experience, I have not run across people with BPD who didn't have some sort of childhood, um, if not trauma, some issues in early childhood. And some things like that might not be reported in this study might have been the parents being alcoholics. That was something I saw uh, um, quite a bit, you know, out having alcoholic parents. They weren't exactly, you know, like abusive in the sense they were just evil people who just beat their kid all the time, but they they would drink, and then when they drink, they would do things like neglect the kid. They would drink and do things like be sexually, you know, active with the kid. They would drink, and they would, you know, maybe beat the kid a little bit, and then they would stop drinking, and they, you know, they'd be okay, right? And so I saw that. That seemed to be something that was um, very common. Now, another great topic for dissertation: alcohol use and BPD. Um, I didn't do a literature search just on that, uh, but that would be an interesting topic, especially if you're if you see some BPD people in your um, uh, in your caseloads, you can find a little bit about that. would be interesting. Okay. And drug addiction would be the other one. Um, if you're interested in that, you could probably do a study for your dissertation on that. You have a, you know, one of your your colleagues who graduated. Uh, Mike Juarez runs a drug clinic down in um, in Oxnard, and uh, maybe you could prevail upon him, interview some of his drug addicts. 
And if you ask him how many have BPD or some kind of personality disorder, he'll tell you all of them, right? Okay. Locus of control and personal agency. BPD symptoms have been linked to, uh, to low, sorry, another type of low personal agency and external locus of control, right? You all know what locus of control is, right? Anybody had a job where you had very low locus of control? No. Now, yeah, I was going to say replacements now, you probably, uh, I mean, for me, it was working at the uh, state hospital as a psychologist, fully, fully, fully licensed psychologist, the lowest locus of control I ever experienced in my life, Ex high external locus of control, very not smart people telling you what to do all the time, not fun. That makes for a really bad work environment. Uh, so again, a lot of people with uh, BPD symptoms um, feel like they are other people telling them what to do and they don't feel like they have a lot of personal agency. The less personal agency the person feels they have, the more severe the BPD symptoms. Of course, you have to wonder with people with BPD whether or not, you know, there really is something in the environment, you know, that's controlling them or not, or whether this is just in their own minds, right? That's the interesting part. Um, they use DPD, uh, DBT to, to treat these folks uh, and it reduced BPD symptoms, but it did not alter the sense of personal agency among the people they studied. So DBT was able to reduce borderline symptoms in the study, but it didn't, didn't alter the person's sense of lack of personal agency, which is interesting. Um, I'm not going to talk about DBT too much in this class because, uh, first of all, you guys probably know more about it than I do. And I think you have old classes on DBT here. Um, I, you know, I'll mention it in passing. Um, you know, I know a little bit about it, um, but you know, not, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on it. Um, uh, so, you know, if there's something in DBT that is relevant or something you want to share, that you know, please pipe up and let me know. I'm interested to know more about it. Um, my feeling is that DBT and probably a lot of the psychodynamic therapies that are being developed, there's probably a lot of overlap, right? Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, ADHD in childhood being associated with adult diagnosis of BPD, that's not surprising. About 4% of people with um, uh, autism spectrum disorder, ASD, were also diagnosable with BPD. And about 3% of people with BPD were diagnosable with, sorry, typo, a ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. Wow, I was really, you know, I'm having really trouble typing my words now. Like, you know, like, I don't know, I'm just becoming dyslexic typist now. It's very interesting. I hope that's not a brain thing. Um, uh, children of mothers diagnosed with BPD had poor psychosocial outcomes, child executive function, social competence, and psychopathological symptoms were affected. And people with BPD have intense, unstable relationships with seen as a result of severe insecure attachment. So again, if you want to look about attachment theory, are you guys learning about attachment theory in other classes? I think Dr. Schwartz, he, he talks about attachment theory a little bit. So um, again, not my area of, of um, attachment theory is like a de-Freudianized version of object relations theory. So all the object relations theory stuff I'm telling you is essentially underlies all the attachment theory, right? Attachment theory comes out of object relations, but it, attachment theory is more, um, more palatable for academic psychologists because they never mentioned Freud, right? So it may, it's like a palatable, oh, as long as don't, Freud is bad and evil, so as long as you don't mention him, but we make a theory, we change some of the wording, we, you know, it's really saying almost the same thing, you know, it's okay. Right. So that's my understanding of attachment. I mean, I generally know a little bit about attachment theory, um, but I like to look at the object relationship stuff in more detail. So, but I think Dr. Schwartz knows a lot about attachment theory. So again, in this case, it's insecure attachment. You guys know what insecure attachment is? I mean, it is sounds it is what it sounds like, right? It's where the baby doesn't securely attach to the parent and later on, you know, he has a need for want, wants to attach to people and all sorts of things, right? So this is all something that you see in borderline personality disorders, insecure, severe insecure attachment. Okay. There is a massive amount of literature on BPD. Just massive. And if you go on Google and you search for uh, books on BPD, you will just come up with hundreds, thousands of books. I mean, it's just massive. A lot of these books are self-help books. Some of the books are person's uh, journey through BPD. Some of them are, uh, you know, actually... Um, 
uh, you know, academic books, you know, how to treat BPD with various types of therapy. Right? Um, some are the dummies book, borderline personality for dummies. Now these, these books, the titles are terrible. These books are very good. I actually find these books to be very, very good. And I haven't seen this one, but I'm betting it's a pretty good book. I would bet you money this is a good book. Um, they usually do really good jobs. So the titles are terrible. Um, when your daughter has BPD, you know, all these things, coping with BPD. Um, so there's just tons of tons of literature out there on this stuff. Um, when I see this much literature on something out there, and I know the prevalence rate is anywhere from 0.5 to 6% of the population. I start wondering if this thing is being overdiagnosed. So it's just a little thing in the back of my mind. Why are there so many books about BPD? It really it would seem like everybody has BPD if you look on the internet, right? But we know it's not everybody. I mean, kids do be, I mean, 6% is a lot of people. You know, that's, that's a huge amount. Um, but it's probably somewhere in between 0.5 and 6. It's probably like 3%. That's still a lot. But there seems to be way too many books on this stuff. So I'm just wondering what's going on. Now, one of the reasons why there might be so much literature is that even though BPD isn't, you know, the, you know, the most prevalent of the personality disorders, it is one that is very disruptive. And, and being around people with BPD can be very disruptive. And it's definitely disruptive in the workplace. And it's definitely disruptive of relationships. So if you have a relationship or you're around even just a friendship or you have somebody who lives in your neighborhood who has BPD, that person may cause lots of, um, they may punch above their weight with regard to the amount of drama that they cause. Okay? And so that may be why this has generated so much literature on this stuff. And this is just the sort of popular book literature. I'm not even mentioning here the research literature, you know, the psychological literature, which is just a ton of it. So this is sort of a poster, poster boy Disorder for personality disorders, right? This one an antisocial personality disorder, the two that people people are, are seem to be, you know, really interested in. So um, yeah, I don't know why this is um it's very interesting. Now, in your broken structures book, there is a very, very good um kind of detailed history of, of the diagnosis of the disorder, right? And why is it called borderline disorder, right? Because originally it was thought between the border between, it represented the border between normal neurotic sort of people and psychotic people. It was in between schizophrenia and normal people, right? So it's in the border between those two things. Uh, that was originally what it was thought. It was also, it had been thought to be a version of depression and thought to be an early on a version of schizophrenia. And people kind of went back and forth about that. And so there's a very interesting history. It's, it, it, he does a very good job in the book of outlining all that stuff. I don't know how useful that is for you guys. So, I mean, you know, it, 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 I think it's good to know. It gives you some depth, you know, when you're studying this stuff. Um, but I mean, I don't know if it's going to really um, affect the way you're going to actually, you know, work with somebody with borderline testosterone. But I think it's an interesting history. And I would encourage you to, to check that out if you have time and read that. As I mentioned, there's many conceptualizations of borderline personality disorder with lots of overlap. It seems that everyone is pretty much describing the same thing, but they use slightly differing language. And here, the devil is going to be in the details of this. The devil is in the details. Okay. Two leading models, as you know, right now, and that, is, that are two big over, you know, umbrella models. Uh, the psychodynamic model, which we're going to talk a bit about, some some of the psychodynamic models, not all of them, and DBT, right? Dialectic behavior therapy. What's dialectic behavior therapy? You can tell, tell me if I'm right, because that's what I tell my undergrad students. It is basically CBT with some Zen meditation, mindfulness meditation added to it, done in it with a group, with a team, a treatment team, usually in an inpatient setting most of the time, inpatient setting with a treatment team. And um, that's my understanding of it. And I think those are all good things, right? You know, I'm big, big, big proponent of, of uh, meditation. I think anytime you can get anybody to meditate, patients or therapists, um, I think it's a great thing. I, I'm um, very, very pro-Buddhist meditation. I self-identify as a Buddhist. So I think meditation is super helpful. Uh, there's lots of different kinds of meditation. Uh, by the way, you may not know that because you just hear about mindfulness when you when you uh, think about psychology. All the psychology people talk about is mindfulness. But there are other types of meditation that are also very helpful psychologically. And if you're interested in that, you may read my paper on uh, 
Tibetan Buddhist Sangha, which is published somewhere out there, but if you want a copy, I'll send it to you, um, to talk about uh, Tibetan Buddhist types of meditation, which do a different thing than, than um, mindfulness meditation. But mindfulness meditation is really good at, at helping a person learn to reflect about themselves. Okay, and that's why it's used. However, in my opinion, I think it's often used out of context. It's taken out of the Buddhist context. And I think it loses something when it goes out of the Buddhist context. Um, meditation, mindfulness meditation, is also very complementary to psychodynamic therapies. Okay, And I say that because I have a friend of mine who is a full-blown psychoanalyst, who's actually uh, trained by my dad, uh, who is also a full-on Zen uh, priest down in LA. Really great guy. He's written a bunch of books on Zen and psychoanalysis. Uh, there's some literature, very interesting literature on that. So I don't want you to think that DBT has the has the monopoly on uh, on on mindfulness meditation or meditation. Okay, it's also used can be used in conjunction with psychodynamic uh, uh, therapies as well. Now I will say CBT DBT have have um, done more to uh, publicize and talk about the benefits of meditation. So I think, you know, clap, you know, give them uh, some, some, some props for that. Okay. And especially in personality disorders where people have a deficit in, in the ability to, to reflect, right. And the deficit in the ability to, uh, for mentalizing, for em empathizing with people, right. Mm -hmm. Meditation is very helpful for that. In Buddhist tradition, by the way, the purpose of meditating is not so much for uh, reflection on yourself. The, the fundamental purpose of meditating in Buddhism, the final end product, is compassion for other people, developing compassion, right, for empathizing. Right? That's the primary goal. So again, when it gets applied to psychology, it gets a little bit you know, nudged in a way that's out of its original context. It's something to keep in mind. Okay. Um, all right, so two models. Uh, we're not going to talk about DBT, as I said, because again, you know more about it than I do, and you're going to take classes on it, and you'll learn lots about that kind of stuff. Does everybody here take DBT classes? Is it required? No, it's not. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I should talk about it more. Um, but you'll you'll learn more about it from people who are experts at it. Uh, I'm going to talk about the psychodynamic thing and in the psychodynamic model. So, other way you can think about um, psychodynamic and DBT is that um, the psychodynamic models. The newer models uh, are e either based on mentalizing, and that is uh, mostly this guy, Peter Fonagy, who's an analytic person here, and Anthony Bateman, and where they talk about DBT deriving from a lack of resilience against psychological stressors, people with DBT, borderline personality with not an ability to generate adaptive, replayable, stressful things, and they in their lives, then experiences build up, and they can't learn from their good experiences. And that's sort of a mentalizing model. And there's a therapy that Fonagy is based, that developed based on that. Um, I'm not going to talk much about that. I think at the end of the semester, we're going to have a class, maybe the last day, where we're just going to talk about new models for treating personality disorders. And so I'll talk about um, Fonagy's mentalizing in more detail when we get to that. And then um, uh, I'll also talk about, uh, I think somebody's doing, doing my dad's book. Uh, on the last day, somebody signed up for the six steps for treatment of the borderline personality disorder. Somebody signed up for that. Anybody remember? Can I, hear? Can I look it up? Should I tell you who it is? Somebody signed up. I know. I'm not going to talk about it today. Kelsey. Kelsey, yeah. Kelsey. So that's the last day. So so I think we're going to save that for the last day of class because, um, first of all, my dad's model is very similar to the Kernberg model I'm going to show you. And I'm going to tell you what the differences are today. But his model also is good for treating other personality disorders. So it actually is a little more general. Um, so we'll save that for the last day. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. Also, we're going to have the time to do everything today. I'll, I'll, we'll save that for the last day. And then I'm going to talk maybe a little bit about Fonagy. And I also want to talk about transference focused psychotherapy, which is the other psychodynamic model, which I'll talk about today a little bit as well. Okay. Um, and then, uh, of course, the biosocial model, which is Marshall Linehan, who's the um, DBT person, originator of DPT. Uh, people with BB. B PD, I'm slurring my words, have inherited genetic vulnerability and have also experienced chronically invalidating environments. 
which produces B, you know, borderline symptoms. Well, this she's saying basically the same thing as the second one. There's nothing, yeah. You know, again, a lot of the same stuff, different labels, different tribes, right? And again, I'm going to be the voice for reason here and say, we need to be integrating all these things, right? We need to come up with integrative therapy models that integrate all the good parts of all these types of therapies, okay? Okay. So here are. Oh. Um, other contemporary views of BPD, uh, there's a guy named Oldman uh, who's written a lot about BPD and he comes up with five sort of subtypes, five types of five subtypes, uh, which basically are all these things are, are aspects of anybody who has BPD, but I like to think of the subtypes as which one is sort of more prevalent, right? So the effective subtype where emotional dysregulation, mood swings are the, are the main thing you see, impulsive subtype where the, it, being impulsive, and that could include self-injury and substance abuse, promiscuity, suicidality, compulsive behaviors, that's more, that, that's the primary thing. Or aggressive types, people have uncontrollable, inappropriate rage or anger. Dependent types were mostly, you know, they present lots of clinginess in relationships, hate, fear, hatred of being alone, lack of interpersonal boundaries, overly accommodating the needs of others, by the way, which sounds like what kind of personality disorder that we haven't really talked about yet. Dependent personality disorder, right? Okay. Uh, and then the empty, characterized by having a lack of identity, lack of trust, feeling of direction, less hard to plan for the future, longing for love, et cetera. Okay, so we, but you see, you'll see some with borderline personality disorders show all these things. So he's really talking here about which one is the primary thing that you see, you know, but that could change over time as well. So I take this with a little grain of salt. Uh, what's interesting to me is that some of these things here, especially the dependent stuff here, the dependent stuff, you are seeing basically if this is the primary thing you're going to see in the person, you know, the borderline person, then you, they might get diagnosed as having dependent personality disorder, right? If somebody comes to me and this is what these are the symptoms they're showing, and these are stable over time, you don't flip through all these things. If this is the state the symptoms they're showing, I'm diagnosing with dependent personality disorder, not with BPD. Okay? This is essentially this is essentially the. the the dependent personality sort of diagnosis, right? Likewise, if somebody comes in and they're being overly dramatic, their affects are swinging back and forth and being overly dramatic, you know, maybe impulsive, some combination deep, I might diagnose them as, as um, histrionic, right? You know, especially if what they're showing me is very theatrical, you know, I might, I might diagnose them as histrionic. And those are two personality disorders I didn't, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't. Made a lecture on both of those. I, I didn't talk about those. Well, we should probably talk about those a little bit later on. I just realized I didn't do a separate lecture on those. Well, I talked to you about cluster B disorders already. I mentioned those already, right? Yeah. But basically, you can think of those things. It's just if you pull out these some of these some of these characteristics of BPD, and that's what you're seeing, not the other stuff. They're going to get those diagnoses, right? But what happens in real life? People get this type. Because again, remember that Venn diagrams of all the personality disorders? There's a huge amount of overlap. And this is why people want to put these things on the spectrum and say, you have a personality disorder with you know, borderline characteristics, mostly borderline characteristics. You have a personality disorder with mostly histrionic characteristics. You have a personality disorder with mostly antisocial characteristics. Personality disorder with mostly narcissistic characteristics. It makes much more sense. Because essentially you can think of histrionic or dependent almost like a subtype of this, right? And, or you might even think of even antisocial personality disorder, aggression, you know? That's not just, that's not all of it's an antisocial personality disorder, but this is a good part, right? So again, BPD sort of is a little bit more encompassing than some of the other ones. And so you can think of some of the other ones in a way of being sort of like a subset of BPD, okay? So here's a nice diagram of contemporary views of borderline personality disorder. So I guess if you're a DDP person or you're a psychodynamic person, you might be described to this sort of diagram here. Pre-birth all the way to late adolescence or early adulthood. And you can talk about early origins, core mechanisms, BPD phenotypes. Okay, what's a phenotype? 
Yeah. Thank you for the expression of a you know thanks for like trade for that good expression. Good. Perfect. And then clinical disorder there. So early origins. Prenatal exposure, epigenetics, family problems, relates to biology. We talked about all the hormone stuff. This relates to infant temperament, insufficient regulation, social communication, abusive withdrawing caregiver. All goes here. Feeds into emotional dysregulation, social cognition deficits, emotional cascades, invalidating interaction, abuse here leads to phenotypes, interpersonal problems, cognitive problems, emotional problems, behavioral problems. And this leads to borderline personality disorder and other disorders. Okay, it could also lead to other things depending on the person's, whatever they're inheriting or whatever the kind of thing in the family life. This is the overall model. Why is this overall model to me? Why do you think, I think this is not very useful. Because it doesn't give you any really indication psychotherapeutically of what to do, right? Then tell you what to do. Okay. I mean, I guess maybe you know, I'm not a CBT, but maybe you're CBT. Okay, I'm going to work on the or maybe something that needs to. Yeah, I don't know. Doesn't doesn't provide any underpinning why you know what how you get how you can get into these things and work with them other than just tell people to think good thoughts or to have good emotions, you know, advice giving. How do you actually, how do you intervene here? This doesn't really give you much, in my opinion, to that. And this is again, why I like the object relations models better, the more detailed object relations model I'm gonna show you, because it actually gives you an indication of what you can be doing in therapy to help these folks. Again, that's my bias, take out the grain of salt. Okay. Other contemporary views, um, you know, again, a lot of pop psychology stuff about this fear, rejection, anger, sadness, you know, okay, you know, we get it. It's just cutting the pie in different ways. You look at borderline personality disorder. The stress cycle, again, yeah, sure, this happens here. You know, snap judging, you're up with impulsive. Intense emotion causes physical arousal. There's been research about this. Uh, person feels overwhelmed. They feel the urge to act. They do something that impulsively they regret. Make the situation even worse. It just keeps going around and around. around. And it makes the person more sensitive to to uh, what's going on the outside world. Okay. Another way to think about it. All right. Questions on all this stuff. Before I get to the second and next step. Anything? Okay. All right. Psychodynamic understanding of borderline personality disorder. Well, of course, I think I told you before that Freud was not one who really studied personality disorders per se. Uh, in a 1908 paper um, uh, on character and anal eroticism, uh, he gave an idea that some psychopathology may not be rooted in neurosis. In other words, it wasn't related to the Oedipal complex, uh, but instead is related to personality traits, something much deeper. Okay. Uh, in 1925, Wilhelm Reich, by the way, this is young, middle-aged Freud here. This is Wilhelm Reich. Check out that here, dude. This guy's a really interesting guy. I'll talk to you about him in a little side note here. Wilhelm Reich in 1925 was perhaps the first psychoanalyst to describe what we know as borderline personality disorder. He just characterized disorder to include pregenital aggression. That means aggression that originates before the Oedipal complex, uh, marked ego and superego impairment, primitive narcissism and impulsivity. He characterized disorder as borderline cases. Like he may have been the first guy to use, it was either him or um, an earlier guy he was the first to use borderline. I think there was another earlier guy who used borderline. He was one of the first to use borderline, uh, the word borderline cases between psychosis and health. Okay, so this is in between psychosis and health. He's an interesting guy. Um, he was an analyst, early analyst, who then kind of goes off on his own and starts talking about how um, the problems with people, it, the underlying root of the problem people is the inability, people don't have enough orgasms. That was his thing. And he kind of goes off the deep end a little bit on this stuff. Some people really like him. I mean, I think that's a pretty interesting idea. 
Uh, but he goes a little off the deep end and he builds something he calls an organ chamber, which is a metal box which has supposedly has some organic material in it. And the idea is that you would sit in these boxes and then it would it would basically it would be like Star Wars. You would get the force would come into you. You would absorb the energy, you know, the ethereal energy of the earth or whatever it is would come in and you would actually make you healthier. Right. So he he got these orgone chambers, orgone chambers. Um, how do I know about these? Because one time I lived on a commune in my younger days, and I dwelt read Wilhelm Reich. I thought I have nothing to do with him on the commune. I'm going to build an orgone accumulator, and I built one of these things, and then sat in it and didn't have any experience. Unfortunately, it didn't work, um, or maybe it did, and that's why I'm here now. I don't know. Um, but he was a really interesting guy. Really interesting. He wrote some really good insightful um, psychoanalytic literature, and then he started going off in the deep end a little bit later on. Um, but some of the deep end stuff is really interesting. Too, so, you know, just so you know, Wilhelm Wright. Um, okay, and again, I'm gonna keep repeating this. There's a lot of overlap among personality disorders and the psychoanalytic literature. This is because psychoanalysis has a theoretical understanding of personality disorders instead of a nosological a naming classification system, right? So again, we're gonna understand personality disorders from a theory, not just from grouping symptoms together, okay? That is the thing that makes it useful. It also helps you guide what you're gonna do clinically with, with folks with personality disorders. Now, borderline personality disorder was not initially seen as treatable via psychoanalysis, especially back in the early days. Um, and again, this has changed quite a bit. And when you read in Broken Structures, you will, you will outline you know, start outlining when people started to treat this. And then the idea that people really started to develop ways of treating it. And what happens is by the seventies or so, really in the, by in the, in the fifties, the forties and fifties, the theory underlying it starts becoming explicated, especially by the British object relations. And then by the fifties and sixties, people are using that object relations stuff to start treating people with uh, personalities or especially borderline personalities. And then by you know the 70s and 80s, 90s, you know this is really now becoming. First of all, it now becomes part of the DSM. It's it, it, uh, borderline personality disorder becomes part of the DSM in DSM three. Okay, DSM three it, it, it actually it's listed as a separate disorder, and has been that way through DSM five. And again, as I think I told you before, they're going to eventually get away from these separate personality disorders and go to a more of a spectrum. Uh, at some point, but it, it gets in there. And once it gets in there as its own disorder, then people really start focusing on developing treatments for it. And the psychoanalytic literature, there are good treatments for, uh, you know, personality disorders, especially BPD. The problem is, I'm giving the punchline away, is that these have to be long-term intensive treatments. Again, the shorter-term treatments, and there are shorter-term ones, just deal with symptoms. They don't get at the underlying stuff. Okay. So the British Object Relations School were really the first to describe in detail or theorize what's going on in borderline personality disorder. And Melanie Klein was the uh, described the splitting of object, re object representations and projective identification. Melanie Klein was a, an analyst, in, uh, a British analyst who, um, uh, was, who specialized a lot with working with children. And Kleinian and really developed a separate kind of sub-school of psychoanalysis, Kleinian analysis. Uh, my analyst was a neo-Kleinian, and they are known for giving um, very direct sort of um, in-your-face interpretations. The neo-Kleinians are a little more subtle about it, but the original Klein, Klein was very just in-your-face, you know, tell you what's going on, like in a lot of interpretations that way. And she developed this theory and this theory is actually pretty good. And this theory really influenced a lot of, um, of how we think about object relations now. So I wanna to talk to you a little about that because this is kind of an important thing and you're not necessarily gonna get this in other classes. So I figured I'd give it to you now. Um, British Object School uh, talks about, Klein talked about um, infants, um, coming out and, and, and the infant had a uh, fear of destruction of its own destructive potential, of its own aggression. And it's this fear of its own aggression, fear of its own, own destruction. And what it does is to protect itself, it projects this out onto an external object using the primary caregiver. Um, and then from the primary caregiver, it is 
infant is fearing persecution because it's made this primary caregiver bad, and now it fears that that because it's bad, it's going to uh, persecute it, right? This is this is the pattern that, that develops, right? This is early infancy, early development, child from zero to I don't know three months, four months, something like that. Right? Then what happens is um, the infant moves into what Klein called the paranoid position. The paranoid position. And in normal development, what happens is uh, good and bad objects become unified later on into what's called the depressive position. So, so paranoid position is early object relations. Depressive position is when basically when these good and bad objects become ambivalent and become you know, seen together realistically. That's sort of normal development. Normal development go from this. I didn't make a diagram of this, but I think I showed you before, right? Um, this these split objects will then become unified. That becomes the depressive position. But in the paranoid position, what happens is the infant wants to protect the goodness. So it splits these objects, the, the primary caregiver object into good and bad. Remember, I told you about when the infant feeding at the breast, it gets the food, the nourishment, it feels good. That becomes a good feeling. You know, it's not getting the food, it's it frustrated, that's a bad feeling, right? It's, it splits those and projects those onto the primary caregiver. So the primary caregiver becomes both good and bad. And the good part gets projected out as idealization, um, you know, excessive optimism, hypomanic states. This is what this feels like, the good feels like. And it projects us from the bad, which is the valuing, paranoid, contemptive, and sadistic thing here, right? And so these things, it maintains a split in order to protect the good and keep the bad from persecuting it. It, 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 it splits these two things, right? So this is the paranoid position. Okay? This is the basis of a lot of object information. Now, what Klein, uh, what, what the book says, the broken uh, uh, structures book, I think is um, quote out, the paranoid position remains the functional template of all behavior. Splitting predominates over repression, and the individual remains vulnerable to seeing others only in idealized and devalued terms. Under such circumstances, there is little real knowledge of other people. The inner world is populated by mere caricatures of self and others. In addition, there is an impairment for the capacity for genuine sadness, guilt, and mourning. Since no aggression is owned and badness is seen to reside externally through the mechanism of projective identification, unacceptable attributes of the self are deposited into others who are subsequently manipulated to live out these attributes. That's projective identification. Depositing stuff into somebody else and then basically manipulating them unconsciously to act that out for you. And this is what happens in therapy, right? This is the counter trend from stuff we've talked about before. Okay. Now, this is Klein. This is young Melanie Klein, by the way. I figure I should show him young. Why should I show him being all old and decrepit? So show him being young. Now, there's a critique of Klein, and this is, I think, relevant. Uh, one thing that um, Klein uh, misses is overlooking the early role of early severe frustration. So in other words, kind of overlooking the role of you know the sort of abusive situation the kid might be in. She's seeing all this all this aggression and things just coming from the child almost biologically. You know, it's already there in the baby, right? It's fear of things, right? And that's the other thing is she's she's attributing a highly a highly structured and elaborate fantasy life to these infants, you know, three month old infants, right? We know now that's probably not the case, right? That's not the case. And she talks about the current this pattern in the first year of life. And this is too early. You know, we know now baby's brains aren't that developed. So this is the critique of, of, of her stuff. Um, but again, with some small tweaking, you know, this starts to make sense, and especially this, this sort of thing starts to make sense here. And again, you know, I, I showed you guys when we talked about narcissism, you saw the Kernberg model, you know, was based roughly on this. Right. He elaborates this uh, quite a bit, but I mean, this is the sort of the template, this idea of defensive splitting. Here. Yeah. Any questions about this? You can go on and train and become a Kleinian analyst or a neo Kleinian analyst. Because almost nobody is as, as full 100% Kleinian anymore. You know, they're, they're, they call them neo Kleinians because they use Klein's ideas, but they're not, you know, They've their interpretive stuff is a little more subtle. It's a little more, you know, up to date. Uh, but again, there are this is a sub school of psychoanalysis, right? Um, Otto Kernberg, who um, 
as I told you, this was for me one of the Bibles of this stuff. Um, and I think for me is the predominant person in the in the world who um, has thought and written about um, borderline personality disorder. Okay? I think he's I think this is his area, right? Narcissistic personality disorder. I would put him and my dad kind of equal. Um, they know each other. Um, I think they are they're they're friends, but there's also sort of a little bit there's a little bit of rivalry going on there. Um, that was my impression. I've met Kernberg. He's a very nice guy. Um, very very nice guy. Really brilliant guy. And later on in the lecture, I'm going to show you. I have some uh, some clips of him that you can either just watch yourself on your own. If we have time, you can see, hear him talk. Uh, very interesting. Very interesting guy. Uh, he's from originally, I think he's from Chile. And he studied with a guy who was trying to take all the psychodynamic stuff and put it into mathematical formula. It's really interesting. So he has an interesting background. And he's basically been in New York most of his professional life. And New York, by the way, is the epicenter of psychoanalytic thought in the United States. Um, I think you guys see the announcement I put out for that program. It was, a, it was at a Delphi University, one of these places. They have all these postdoc programs in psychoanalytic, psychodynamic training. If you're ever interested in doing this stuff, you know, you can go to New York. By the way, also, I just got a thing from the Northern California Psychoanalytic Institute where my supervisor went and my analyst went. Um, they are also have, they have a partially online training program now. Um, they're, they're starting to do more distance um, training for analysts. So if, again, at this point in your career, you, you need to get finished with your degree and you know that's the thing. But just to keep in mind that if you if you like this stuff, you want to get further training later on, there's lots of opportunities. You don't have to go to New York. Um, though if you go to New York, you'll be in the heart of it, right? That's, you know, Kernberg's there and all these guys are there. Um, all right. So Kernberg published a paper on borderline personality organization in 1967. Later on, uh, a couple books. Uh, this is one of them. The main one here. There's also one on severe personalities where it's very, very good stuff. Highly, highly recommend this. Um, again, if, if you'd already taken a class on psychodynamic theory before this class, we would have read this. We would have read these books. There would have been the textbooks for this class. So, so Kernberg is really, um, to me, he is really the turning point in sort of the modern treatment of borderline personality disorder and the modern understanding of it. Okay? Uh, he says that borderline personality disorder is not a transitory state, but is a stable condition. So this is interesting. Borderline personality disorder is a stable condition of instability. Does that make sense? It's a stable condition of instability. One of the hallmarks of the condition is that people are unstable but they're stably unstable. They're predictably unstable, right? Uh, he, his description of borderline personality includes <clears throat> chronic and diffuse anxiety, lots of neurotic features, right? Uh, which include phobias and all sorts of, you know, kind of edible things. A lot of times the edible stuff is really tinged with aggression. Um, precocious development of edible issues, they develop too soon and oral rage that contaminates the Oedipal trauma. And this is one of the highlights you see if somebody comes in and they've got Oedipal things going on, but there's a lot of rage and it's related to the sort of oral stage stuff, then you can start thinking about, you know, borderline stuff. Um, he also talks about how there are <clears throat> egosyntonic, uh, <clears throat> obsessive compulsive tendencies, something borderline, and you know what egosyntonic is now, right? Right, egosyntonic, something that, does not seem strange to the person, seems like this, their ego, their executive function, so this is just sort of normal to them. Okay, it doesn't, doesn't stand out. Uh, bizarre conversion symptoms in hypochondriasis. Sometimes in BPD people, you'll see um, them reporting, you know, weird uh, physical complaints in their body, you know, headaches, um, other things, you know, they'll be worried that something's wrong with them, something will come with that. A polymorphic perverse sexuality. I just love that phrase. Polymorphous perverse sexuality, meaning that they'll some points they they have a lot of times they'll be very promiscuous, <clears throat> and they'll be a little bit non-discriminating about who they have sex with. Uh, and that could be gender, or whatever. Um, sometimes, sometimes not, but they tend to be a little. Um, and this is what polymorphic polymorphic means: many shapes. 
right? So their sexuality can take on many shapes. And perverse is a little judge, judgy, but it just basically means that they might have sex in ways that are not so vanilla, put it that way. Non-vanilla, polymorphic non-vanilla sexuality. How's that? It often shows up. They may have schizoid, paranoid, and hypomanic symptoms. Uh, you don't know what hypomanic is, right? They're manic, but not quite so hard. It's sort of um, if they have really hypermanic symptoms, then you might start thinking bipolar. Okay? We'll talk about differential diagnosis in a few minutes. Uh, impulsivity and addictions. And uh, that's what my book is about, addictions. Uh, very common. And addictions can be to anything, sex, gambling, food, um, not eating, um, <clears throat> you name it. Okay? You can become addicted to it. They can have a narcissistic as-if personality and antisocial tendencies. Remember the as if personality is the kind of personality it's like, you know, like whatever you want them to be, they will manifest that for you and show you that, right? But there's nothing underneath it. Ego weakness, poor anxiety tolerance, impulsivity, inability to sublimate. In other words, inability to plan for the future, to take whatever their urges are now and then to transmute those into things that are constructive. Um, and that helps, that, 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 that uh, means that they often have trouble at work or in school. Okay. Primary process thinking, unstructured situations, they may start spacing out. Um, again, sometimes brief um, psychotic episodes. Um, you know, whatever's going on in the unconscious may just sort of spill out when they're not structured, and this can lead to acting out. And this is one of the things in therapy you want to make sure that you know, you've been in agreement not, not to act out. Uh, specific defenses are splitting, projective identification, and we'd also include in that some dissociation and pathological internal object relations. We're going to get talk to that in detail. Ah, uh, here we go. Here's my diagram. But I am sensing it is time for a break. Let us take a break and stretch, and we'll come back and dig into this thing. Okay. Yeah, take a little break, um, and then we'll come back and, and do this in 10 minutes. Okay. But 10.30 now, so 10.40. It's been so far, you guys, or you just have to Yeah. Yeah, you can order anything. Oh, let me know if you know. Thank you. 
Yeah. Look. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's too. Oh, because the last time I saw her, like two weeks before or two months before. I know. Like Ron. I know. Yeah. I don't know. 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 All right. Um, okay, so here is the diagram. Which hopefully you have the slides up in front of you. I didn't put these up, right? They're in the yeah. they're in the previous yeah. right? Okay. So um, this is what we saw basically when we talked about narcissistic personality disorders. It's pretty much the same up until this point. And what's different is this. So again, we have the infant self-soothing is not functional, internalization of part objects, 
over-representation of bad objects, primary caregiver, caregiver to an absolutely inconsistent, the I hate you, don't leave me thing going on here. Um, this sort of, you know, bad parenting, bad caregiving going on here, abusive, right? And then you have this symbiosis state in the child object representation of the mothering person becomes split into good and bad. There's a lack of integration, egocentronic impulsivity, uh, intensification of affects, and extreme oscillation between contradictory self-concepts going on here. And again, primitive idealization, omnipotence and service of control of the primary good object and the defensive primary denial of devaluing, projective identification, lack of self-object differentiation, leading to uncanny empathy on the bad object. The uncanny empathy is very important in human therapy because the uncanny empathy is something that you will experience with people with borderline personality disorder. In other words, you'll go in and you'll do your thing and you'll have some unconscious blind spot of your own. And it, it's very weird. It almost feels like magic that this person sitting in front of you who doesn't know you and you've been very neutral, you haven't shared things about yourself, they will be able to poke where it hurts the most unconsciously and pick at things that where you have your own unconscious fears, your own blind spots, your own unresolved issues. They just uncannily seem to be able to know what those are and they'll bring things up. You know, like if you're a young therapist like I was and I was seeing from a borderline personality disorder, they would, you know, I'm a little unsure of myself. They would bring up things about that. Like, oh, you feel unsure of yourself. Oh, you know, you know, something having to do, you know, oh yeah, young people don't know how to do therapy. It's just be something, just cutting remark. And it would just go right to the core. And this is why at the end of the sessions, I feel like a train had run over me, right? I thought, how can this person know this stuff about me? Are they stalking me? You know, no, because they were starting to stalk me. And then I said, we can't do that. But they, how would they know these intimate details about my own blind spots in my own personal life? They just pick up on it. It has something to do with this thing, this projected thing. And they can just pick up on this thing. It's really uncanny. And it's very disconcerting as to you as a therapist. Very, very disconcerting. It's one of the things that makes working with people with borderline personality sort of very difficult to work with because they will devalue in ways that just cut you to the core. Whatever your thing is, whatever your issue is, they will find them, right? Um, you know, so it's, it's, Herbert calls it uncanny empathy. Right? It's just part of the projecting, and you will be this bad, you'll be the good object. When you're the good object, you will be thought of as being idealized and thought of as being omnipotent, and that you can control and do everything. You'll be the best doctor. You'll be the person who's curing them. You'll be the one who's you know, making sure that they don't do these things. It'll all be because of your omnipotence. And then you'll flip. And you'll be denied. You'll be denied. You're the worst therapist. You're horrible. We're going to report you to the board of psychology. You know, um, blah, 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 blah. And, and again, who is going to have all your clients that you can have patients you're going to have? Who is more likely to report you to the board of psychology? Or to sue you. Borderline personality disorder. Most lawsuits against psychologists are people with borderline personality disorder. There's a I should have there's a study about that. I should have found that. Remind me somebody, I'll try to find that and put that up. But that's this is who's going to sue you in your practice. And what happens um, because of this? I'm going a little off tangent here. What happens because of this? What do you do even unconsciously in your practice? Not think borderline clients. It's the 800 pound gorilla in the corner, right? That people don't like to acknowledge unless they're really honest. They don't like to take borderline clients. And then um, borderline clients will then go to the emergency room, right? And they'll get drugs from general practitioners and uh, to deal with their symptoms because they're not, you know, people don't want to do therapy with them. Um, also, a lot of people who are becoming psychologists or especially master's degree level people uh, are not trained to work with borderline people. Uh, you, need, you need some training. You need to get supervision from somebody who knows uh, how to work with these kind of folks. So when I was working with borderline person, I felt completely lost and ashamed. That's my own unconscious issue. That was the uncanny, uncanny ability to get at me was my underlying sense of shame, which has to do with my parents being divorced when I was a kid. They don't know that, 
you know, my, my, my patient didn't know that my parents were divorced when I was a kid and I had some unconscious shame around that. A lot of divorced kids have that. They didn't know that. She was able just to push that button, you know, like, and so I was, I felt like I had no idea what I'm doing. This is, I'm overwhelmed. I can't see this person. But I had a supervisor who was very, very experienced working with borderline. And I go to him, he goes, ah, the uncanny ability. This is what's going on. You know, and he explained this kind of stuff to me. And he knew my background, you know, you know, they're they're activating this thing. It's your blind spot there. This is what you need therapy for. Remember, I told you before how sometimes your supervision can be, you know, sort of bordering on therapy a little bit for you, right? This was something I needed to do. I needed to go into therapy and work out, you know, my issues around shame, you know, having to feel responsible for a parents' divorce, all these kind of things that you know I had going on underneath. And um, which luckily I did, you know. Um, but if you have something you haven't dealt with, your borderline patient will point that out to you, right, in some way, shape, or form. And if you don't have supervision by somebody who uh, can explain this to you and help you through it, um, it's going to be very difficult. And so this is my big thing: is you know, it, it's it's like a it's like a it's a bi-directional problem. One problem is that a lot of therapists won't see borderline people because they're difficult to work with, you know. They don't feel like they can be effective with them. They don't want to go through that emotional roller coaster that they get put on with them. On the other hand, um, the people who are not trained to, to treat borderline people will take them on as patients and then not do well. And it's not good for the patient and it's not good for, for, um, for, the, uh, for the client, okay. uh, or it's not good for the therapist. And you need to be also be thinking about long-term therapy. So I saw the longest time I saw one of my borderline patients for was about two and a half years, once a week therapy. And that wasn't enough. I think I'd like to think, I'd like to tell myself at the end of that two and a half years, when I was changing agency, I was in an agency, a, a community counseling agency, and I was changing agency, I was going off to a different place and um, you know, different geographical place. And uh, by the way, the termination, very difficult. Well, I'll talk about all sorts of stuff coming up in the termination, very, very difficult. I'd like to say, tell myself that I think she got some benefit out of therapy. I think she probably, you know, was able to deal with some of her you know, more egregious symptoms, you know, or, you know, abated maybe a bit more of, uh, a bit more reflective capacity, a little bit more being able to understand herself. But by no means uh, was she cured. You know, by no means did she did her borderline personality organization evolve to a regular neurotic personality organization. That did not occur, and that would not occur unless she had probably been in therapy for five to eight years. You know, seeing therapists four or five times a week. You know, the personality organization doesn't change. Um, this is this is hardwired in at a young age. The cement, the cement dries, and so you have to go back in. It takes a while to be undo this. Okay. A very important thing to consider. Um, so if you're going to work with somebody with personality disorder, that's what you've got to be thinking. Now, you could say to yourself, I'm going to do CBT. I'm just going to see them for you know eight sessions, 10 sessions, just help them with the symptoms, and then they're going to be sent on their way, or I can refer them to a psychoanalyst or something if they want to do more. That's fine. I think if, if, if your goals are just doing symptom stuff, you know, helping deal with the symptoms, you know, good short-term therapy probably can be helpful. It's going to be a little whack-a-mole. You're going to get some symptoms down and then they're going to, something else is going to pop up over here later, right? Because this pattern is still going on, like this, especially the splitting pattern is still going on. But, you know, that may be helpful to somebody and there's nothing wrong with that. And so, again, if you were talking to psychoanalytic people or whatever, and they've got their noses up and you're being all snooty because you're doing CBT, that's stupid. You know, I mean, the analytic people need to realize that, you know, for a lot of these folks, symptom reduction may be helpful for them, just for them to be more comfortable in their lives, even though their personality organization isn't going to mature or change, that there's nothing wrong with symptom reduction. Okay. So that's 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 something. But again, if you're going to work with somebody, even doing CBT, obviously DBT, you guys have a program here, you will learn how to do that under supervision. That's great. You know, but even if you're doing CBT, you know, get some supervision of somebody with CBT who's worked with personality sort of people before, right? especially BPD. Okay? 
very, very important. Big mistake that people make. You want to feel like you're getting your head over the weeds, you know, this is all you got to go see somebody like this, right? And again, some people like to specialize in working with these folks. My friend down in the, in the valley, Dr. Hamer, this is his, you know, especially my supervisor, loved to work with DVD people. That was his thing. And I asked him why one time. He said, oh, it's because I grew up in a crazy Italian family. That you know, was his response. He was Italian. Um, and he, he worked with people with BPD and he worked with psychotic people. He liked to do that. That was, he enjoyed that. Um, you know, you have to, you know, decide yourself uh, what you like to do. Um, and maybe, maybe, maybe you could work with somebody like a BPD person and do symptom reduction and you're okay, but the psychoanalytic stuff, there are certain poker unconscious things, you know, that's too much for you. You don't want to do that. That's fine. You know, but it's, it's like Clint Eastwood said, you know, man's got a man, men and women, you know, it's got to know his limitations, right? You know, you got to know your limitations. You got to also know what you like. I'm going to be a little Dallas here. For you. you also got to know what you have an appetite for as a therapist, right? You have an appetite to work with personality people. You have an appetite to work with uh, psychotic people, right? For me personally, I found working with borderline people very difficult. And if I was having a full-time practice, I would not populate it with borderline personality. I might work with somebody who was on the milder end of the spectrum, but I would not work, again, I think my personal choice would not be work with somebody who had severe borderline personality disorder. I would work with psychotic people. I, you know, my personal makeup is, you know, I, when I came up through the ranks, you know, I, I was in a, worked in a lot in facilities. So I worked my way through college on the graveyard shift. I basically lived with a hundred psychotic people every night. Didn't bother me. Working with them, talking to them, didn't bother me. Them freaking out, trying to burn the building down, doing all sorts of crazy things, didn't bother me. Um, some people that would really bother them, right? Working with severely developmentally disabled people, severely autistic people, I had my case population, didn't bother me. You know, I'd have friends and colleagues come visit me at the hospital sometime and, and I'd take them down to the wards and they'd be, they'd be shaking by the time they got freaked them out so much. It's like they, they were suddenly on the sets of the movie Freaks. You guys see that movie Freaks? They were just, you know, shaking. It didn't bother me. Yeah, I didn't have any problem with that. You know, so you got to know what your appetite for is, what you what you like, you know, what, what you want to work with. And again, this will put you out to you. Okay? That's my little aside. That's a little aside. Yeah. This thing here, so this is sort of the over the out, outward view, the big uh, the, the step back view, right? This is what's going on here, the splitting thing. But now we'll go into the person mentally. So this is actually going on, and this is what, when you're doing therapy with this person, you will, you will see this alternating between good and bad. You will alternate between good and bad, omnipotent and, and worthless, right? You will, you, will, you, will, you will get these projected on you. So these are actually objects that this projection is happening on, right? But what's really going on, what's going on in the person's mind, if you want to use that term, the mind, inside their psyche, their psyche or their mind, their internal world, right? And I think Kernberg wrote a book called Internal World, External Reality. It's another one very good recommend. This is what's going on. We have a non-cohesive self, or we might think of this sort of as like the idea of the diffuse identity. And in this identity, you have dissociated ego fragments. And within those dissociated ego fragments, you have sort of partial self images, you have emotions, affects, and you have part objects, right? Pieces of these, you know, things from the outside world, you know, pieces of things. And you have a bunch of these dissociated ego things in this, and they sort of and they, they, they sort of don't really coalesce, they're not really integrated. Okay. Then you have an unintegrated superego. Meaning that the superego is not completely integrated into the self, but it's also seen as a part of a part of the object representation, of the object representations, right? But also in the psyche, in this internal world, are these not objects, but representations of these objects, right? Representations, mental internalized representations of these of these objects. Okay? My dad wrote a book called Primitive Internalized Object Relations, where he talks about object representations that you internalize. You, you, you take, an, in, you take an, an image of these things and internalize them. And that's what this is. These are internalized images of the good and the bad, right? These are split. These are what are split, right? Again, primitive idealization, devaluing, okay? 
uh, uncamping, uncamping, these things, these internal things. These are all floating around in this internal world of the person. And this, this thing's going on. Unintegrated superego, right? This is the ego ideal, right? The, the, the omnipotent, the best, you know, the idealized person. That's partly superego. Also, this, um, you know, feelings of guilt, feelings of being bad. That's also partly superego here. It's unintegrated. It's not completely integrated with itself. And so this is going on. And then what happens is these good object representations are then projected out you know, the projection of projective identification out to actual people in the world, you, the therapist, other people in the person's life. Also, the bad primary object representations are projected out into people in the world, right? And this is this creates the in, unstable interpersonal relationship and the cycling between these things going on. This stuff floating around here, all unintegrated, right? Does that make sense? The difference between this and narcissism is the narcissist is able to sort of make this self stuff, all this stuff floating around in the self more cohesive because it can center around some feeling of being special, having some kind of special power that gets, that gets noticed by this parental figure, that gets internalized, you know, this feeling of being special. They can coalesce the, the self around that. And this le leads to sort of a little bit more organization in the personality. The borderline person does not have that. Right. And again, it's a spectrum, right? You know, some are going to be more disorganized than others. Now, if this is completely disorganized, where you don't even have a coherent self and things are just floating around here, and you've got all these objects and things are floating around unintegrated, that's psychosis. Right? That's psychosis. Right? That's psychosis. That's more like this here. Okay, that's psychosis. But this is there's some integration, but not like it's a little dissociating things. Here. Right? And the idea in therapy, according to Kernberg, is that you, um, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but you're going you're gonna to work with this. this. This gives you a blueprint on how you're going to work with this person. That's why this kind of theory, to me, is very useful, because it gives you a blueprint of what you can do to work with this person. First of all, you are going to be on the, you're going to experience this projection and projective identification. Okay? And projective identification is what? Okay. Transference. Related to transference. It's basically when the client will project in the context of therapy, like negative aspects from themselves onto the clinician. Like, that projection. What, what's projective identification? It's an important thing to remember because this will happen with borderline personalities. Projective identification is where they'll project on you, in this case, the good or the bad, and they will, they will, they will basically unconsciously manipulate you to become the person that they projected on. In other words, they're projecting these bad things upon you, right? That you're, you know, that you're this horrible person or whatever it is. You will start to feel horrible. You will start to feel the things that they want you to do. They want you to, they're basically trying to get you to reenact this, okay? And so the projective identification will get you to do that. So this is a form of countertransfer. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a form of countertransference. You'll start feeling the stuff that, You'll become the you'll become the bad or the good parent object, right? It'll make you become that. You'll feel devalued. You'll feel bored. You know, you'll feel rage, or you'll feel omnipotent. You'll feel like you know you're the you're the shit. You know, like you, you, you know you're the best therapist that lived. You start feeling that, and you start feeling like floating above you. You'll feel that. That's more. By the way, in my opinion, that is more dangerous than this. This the omnipotent feeling is very dangerous. I'm, I can do anything as a therapist, right? That's when you start getting in trouble. That's when you know, people start sleeping with their patients. They do all sorts of things. They want the business deal. They feel omnipotent as a therapist. That should be a big warning sign, right? Again, that's why we need to have supervision as therapists. I can remember uh, a couple of times where I left therapy sessions and went home and felt like I could do anything. It's felt completely omnipotent. I can do anything. I can do anything. I'm the greatest therapist I've lived. I'm going to write the greatest books. You know, well, and again, this happens also with narcissistic people who get a little that. Projective identification. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Check, you know, projective identification. I'm getting this. I'm, this projected. I'm now becoming that. i thinking that I'm that idealized person that they want me to be. Right? Then I go back and it'll be this. 
horrible person or I'm bored, you know, or I just feel like guilty that I'm punching my button, right? Feel guilty, you know. But flop back and forth, depending on point, you know. Okay. This is also dissociative. Another thing Kernberg talks about. This is a form of dissociation. This is like kind of a minor dissociation, right? Dissociation. Right? If you get somebody who is DID, when we talk a little about this in a few lectures, you know, this dissociation gets to the point where these things are so split off, these are things so fragmented that these become separate sort of personalities. This is a minor dissociation. So one way psychoanalysts think about uh, borderline personality disorder, it's on the spectrum of dissociation. DID over here, super dissociated into separate alters, personalities, and borderline personality where you're just dissociating the good and the bad, right? Good and bad objects, right? So this is the dissociation. And so again, people with borderline personality will experience a lot of dissociation. Defensive dissociation, right? So this is the Kernberg model. Does that make sense? You guys kind of follow along with this? It's okay. So this model, I like this model. Um, this is the model when I, you know, when this is what I was trained on. Um, this is what I used, you know, to help me understand uh, people with BPD. Um, and I find it very helpful. Okay. I find it very helpful because it really explains what's what what I'm experiencing as the therapist, the countertransference and those kind of things. And it and, and the idea here is what you want to do in therapy is you want to you want to address this cohesiveness. This is also a way of thinking of identity fusion. This doesn't know who they are, right? You can't really reflect on who they are. So this is what one you want to address in therapy. And here's a quote um, from uh, uh, your book, um, I'll just read you part of this. Uh, important to note that Kernberg's borderline personality organization refers not to a discrete nosological entity, but to a level of personality organization that exists underneath all severe character pathology, including narcissistic, schizoid, hypomanic, paranoid, antisocial, as if, and infantile personality disorder. So all basically this, this model, you can apply this model to all, basically all personality disorders. You know, what is going on here? Maybe there's something else going on, or maybe there's something that's predominated here. You know, this is sort of the underpinning. What you're basically saying is there's something going on in the early childhood here where the parenting has problems, and then the person has some sort of pattern, defensive pattern, splitting, maybe something else going on here that leads to this the personality, the, the internal world not being integrated, right? Not being not not able to developmentally mature properly. This underlies all personality disorders, basically according to Kern. And so it, it, it becomes sort of a general model. You can think of it that way. Okay. All right. Uh, other studies on developmental pathology. Remember, I said that you know other people. You know, it's not just psychoanalysts who are saying that you know that it's that the stuff you know, occurs in early you know originates in early childhood. Other people, researchers, are talking about this, right? Um, and again, you, you can. See this, you know, uh, it's Philip Herzog and colleagues. And by the way, I don't think that's not a typo. I think his name did have two P's. At least that's what showed up on the thing. Um, but there, you can see this, um, you know, again in these research studies, they're they're tracing stuff back to early childhood. So Herzog examined the idea that childhood maltreatment results in two developmental sequelae that are related to borderline personality disorder. The first is development of the coarse grain alexith alexithymic model, right? What does alexithymine mean? You guys know that word? I spelled it right. I spelled it wrong. Yeah. Problems with emotions, feeling emotions. Self and others. Uh, the second uh, thing is the results in rigidity and flexibility of belief about self and others, as well as a loss of confidence and precision about beliefs in the consequences of social behavior. So also not understanding what the consequences of your behavior is, okay? Uh, Over-reliance on sensory information, social feedback, emotional liability, impulsivity, and hypersensitivity. But the idea is that it just comes from early childhood, okay? Another study by uh, Clementine Estrick and colleagues demonstrated adverse child experiences contribute to the development of borderline personality-related traits. 
Okay, and also this is also related to neurocognitive impairment. Um, kids that are maltreated, abused, emotionally invalidated, more likely to have BPD traits, right? Uh, she relates this to impairments in the amygdala, hippocampus, and prefrontal cortex. Hopefully I'll talk about this a little more in the other lecture. Um, but again, comes from early childhood. These are non-psychoanalytic people telling you this comes from early childhood. A study by Annegret Krauss-Utz and colleagues examined reaction times and high-frequency heart rate variability. They found when presented social cues, people with borderline personality disorder had increased uh, reaction times and lower heart rate um, variability. You know, heart rate variability is a measure of health. Your heart's supposed to be able to speed up and slow down. You know, when, when, it, when it has trouble doing that, that's a sign of uh, things are not good. It just stays you know, beating high, it takes a long time to come down. That's actually something that, uh, you know, uh, medical people get concerned about. Uh, people with borderline personality disorder, again, this also may be a, a proxy for stress. And again, they found that the people in their study had adverse childhood events, okay? So again, um, that's, you know, the, this is really this idea about this origin early childhood is really, it's really, you know, scientifically now been shown. This is not just conjecture from talking to a bunch of people in therapy who have borderline personality disorder, but actually scientific studies, you know, looking at this stuff are finding the same things. Okay? But it's important to know because you will get colleagues who will tell you, oh, it's just something that happens in adolescence, right? My colleague says this to me. I'm like, no, no. but it's not the case. Okay? Important for you to know that. Let's talk a little bit about pharmacological treatment of, of borderline personality disorder. This is important because when somebody comes to see you with borderline personality disorder, they're going to start listing off all the medications they take. Back in the day, what would have been the primary medication they would have been taking? Any idea? But they have been labeled that they were given the Sometimes, uh, sometimes, but let's say they were actually diagnosed properly with borderline personality disorder. What would they? What would? What would they be given? Not back in the day as much. Uh, let's just say, let's just say, you know, 10, 20 years ago, what would have been the drug of choice for borderline person? Which, uh, which I saw when people came, uh, borderline people came to see me, they inevitably were, would be on, have some of this in their purse, usually sitting there. Benzodiazepines, anti anxiety drugs, prescribed like pop rocks. I mean, you know, everybody had them, you know, like you, and they get them from their general practitioner. They go to the general practitioner, I'm anxious, I'm having these things, write them out a script for benzodiazepines. What's the problem with benzodiazepines? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Klonopin and Xanax and these things. What's the problem? Addicted, very addicted. And what, what's the problem with being addicted to them? What happens when you come off of them? The withdrawal is really severe really bad. You got to titrate people off of these things. We had patients in the hospital on various, a lot of, a lot of them had clonopin. Um, and the difference between the different types of benzodiazepines really has to do with how long they take to get out of your system. Clonopin, I think, was more long acting, if I recall correctly. I may be wrong about that. We had a lot of people on clonopin. And when we take them off, we would have to titrate them very, very slowly over a period of weeks and weeks and weeks to get them down off it because otherwise you take them off it right away you get a lot of problems um that was a, that was a drug that was it was used a lot for um for borderline everybody come in the office they'd have they'd have some xanax in their purse you know pills and they would take them where'd you get that oh my general practitioner did so i went and saw my anxious right um that's less so now okay um and there was a study done by gerald uh Gartlander and colleagues, they found that psychopharmacologies are limited use for treating BPD. Basically, these are treating symptoms. They're not, they do not affect the person. They don't treat the BPD itself. What you see now, what's more now is second generation antipsychotics, anticonvulsants, anticonvulsants, by the way, used also for bipolar, and antidepressants uh, are being used, but these do not consistently reduce the severity of the overall BPD disorder. They're just treating pieces of it. Poor evidence that anticonvulsants may improve, it may improve specific symptoms such as anger, aggression, and affective liability associated with BPD. Um, if they were effective, then you might think that they really have bipolar. Okay. Um, second generation, and, and the studies, by the way, are, are pretty small. They're usually uh, single case studies, a lot of single case studies. 
A second generation antipsychotic has been shown to have little effect specifically on BPD symptom severity. However, SGAs do improve general psychiatric symptoms among BPD patients and may be helpful for this. And you're seeing more and more of uh, SGAs being prescribed for uh, for long personality disorder. They don't they don't they don't they don't fix it, but they may make uh, the symptoms a little bit more tolerable. Uh, pharmacotherapy very widespread in treating BPD, even though the preponderance of evidence does not support its efficacy. Okay, so very important to know that. Uh, Juan Pascal and colleagues report that although no psychotropic drugs have been officially approved for the treatment of BPD, medications are routinely prescribed for these patients. Uh, this study evaluated uh, changes in pharmacological management in 620 patients with BPD in Spain over the past 20 years. They found that the majority, uh, that uh, main finding was that the percentage of patients receiving pharmacotherapy decreased over time. Okay, so this seems to be a decrease, which is probably a good thing. Antidepressant prescription rates remained high and stable, even though they don't really necessarily do anything. Uh, but you know, you know how it is. SSRIs, especially, just they're thought to be like, especially when they came out, a panacea for everything. So just give them to everybody. Oftentimes, again, prescribed by general practitioners. Some with borderline personality disorder goes to see their GP. They say they feel depressed. They're going to get a prescription for. For, um, you know, Zoloft or, Zan Zoloft or uh, what's the other one, you know, I'm talking about, um, an SSRI, okay? So that's, uh, that seems to be stable. Um, benzodiazepine use, however, has decreased significantly during the study period uh, from 77% to 36%. So that's a good thing, I think. And then second generation uh, uh, antipsychotics have increased uh, from 15% to 32%, okay? Psychiatric comor comorbidity was the main factor associated with pharmacological treatment. And again, comorbidity means they have some sort of psychological symptoms that can be ascribed to a different disorder. But as you see in borderline personality disorder, people have a lot of, there's a lot of symptoms that are overlapped with other disorders. So that's, but that can be an excuse to give somebody a bunch of different drugs. And that seems to be what, what, what that's gone on here. Okay. Pharmacotherapy is more prevalent in patients with BPD than is recommended in most clinical guidelines because the clinical guidelines are made by psychiatrists. They're the experts in prescribing for these things. And most of the prescriptions are probably being done by general practitioners. Okay. Now, this argues for the fact that we don't have enough psychiatrists, we don't have enough people trained in psychology because general practitioners, fantastic people, wonderful people, people you want to have, you know, in the world that help you, but they get very little psychiatric training. They get a they get a rotation during their clerkships and maybe in their residencies. They don't get much psychiatric training. There are not enough psychiatrists, okay? And this is one of the arguments why psychologists should get prescription privileges because you need more people who are able to prescribe the stuff who are actually trained in clinical psychology, right? Uh, you have nurse practitioners, also not really enough of them. A lot of them don't specialize in psychiatric medicine. Um, you, you'll see them prescribing. Uh, you know, their training in psychology is not, in my opinion, my opinion, take with a grain of salt, is not the same as what you're getting. And so the idea of having people trained in clinical psychology, trained in psychopathology and diagnosis and treatment, um, would be better off being prescribers. And this is the argument for uh, prescription privileges for psychologists. Um, and again, I think in your lifetime, you're going to be seeing this. Again, you could probably move to New Mexico or Illinois, uh, some different places, and you can, you, can, you can train and become a prescriber. Join the armed services, become a, you know, a psychologist in the army or something, you can, you can be trained to do this. So I think the writing is going to be on the wall. Again, I told you earlier this morning, you know, I like PsyD degree. I think the PsyD degree is set up so that you can incorporate psychopharmacology training into the degree. And you'll probably start seeing more schools doing this as a matter of course, as prescription privileges become uh, more prevalent in more places. But this is the reason why, you know, um, because you have GPs doing all the prescribing for people with more lung personality disorder, all this kind of stuff. And so I think it, I, to me, the argument is pretty good. I personally wouldn't want to prescribe drugs, but you know, I think the argument um, that you guys should have the option of being able to do that it's really good. And again, you know, I think I told you this before, but the, the counter argument is that then if you're all able to prescribe drugs, you're going to make a lot more money prescribing drugs than you are going to be doing psychotherapy. And then pretty soon, none of the psychologists won't do psychotherapy anymore. But the difference is, however, that psychotherapy actually cures people. The drugs do not cure people. 
that what you have now, the tool that you have actually cures people, can cure people, even a borderline personality disorder. Even if they've got to go about five years, four times a week to therapy, you can cure them a borderline personality disorder. You can't do that with a drug, all right? So, you know, I, I, I worry that when prescription privileges become widespread, psychologists, because of the financial incentive, will no longer do psychotherapy. And then that will be left to the master's level people, which I think is a little bit of a shame, personally. So two sides of that coin, right? That's something you guys probably in your professional lifetime ought to be thinking about, okay? Because you'll probably have the opportunity to become prescribers at some point if you if you want to do that. Okay? All right, more, more, more pharmacological treatment. Positron emission, emission tomography. Uh, you know what that is, right? Where you put somebody in a scanner and you, I think, PET, you may inject something, a contrast agent, I can't remember. But basically, you're going to, in functional near-infrared spectroscopy, you're looking inside the body, I've demonstrated abnormalities in brain metabolism and hemodynamics. Hemodynamics means the blood flow in, in borderline personality disorder, especially in the frontal limbic system. However, the role of medications on brain metabolism and hemodynamics is still very unknown. Overall, PET studies have shown an effect of psychotropic agents on brain metabolism, especially in the frontal and temporal areas. And I put this up here just to show you where they are. This area of the brain, which we know is also affected in, uh, we here in depression, right? There's some overlap here in depression. Um, so this is, uh, this is you know, also why it may be that these second generation psychotic agents are, are, are helping out and theoretically why the uh, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitor antidepressants sh should work, but maybe they don't, but they should because they affect that part of the brain, okay? Um, this study says they, the, the SSRIs do uh, appear to correlate with clinical improvements. There's some question about that. Brain hemodynamics, blood flow of the brain do not be do not seem to be significantly affected by the most per commonly prescribed drugs in BPD, uh, suggesting that the therapeutic actions of medications are not mediated by changes in blood flow, in brain blood flow. Okay. Uh, IV ketamine. Ketamine, as you know, is the new wonder drug for treating depression. You can have somebody who's depressed and suicidal and put them in the hospital and give them infusion of ketamine. 20 minutes later, they're snapped out of it. There's a lot of research now looking at the underlying uh, um, uh, principles of why this is working, how ketamine actually is working at a molecular level. A lot of research on that right now. Turns out ketamine may be helpful in treating patients with major depressive order who also have borderline features. Not surprising. Because again, same part of the brain is being affected. Somehow ketamine is getting in there and doing stuff. There's some really interesting stuff on that coming out now. Um, you can... Look that up. I don't know. You probably get a class in depression. I assume you're going to get some learn about depression somewhere along your path. And they'll probably talk to you about ketamine at this point. You should know about ketamine because it's, you know, I mean, I get a patient come in, they're depressed and they're suicidal. I'm taking them to the hospital and getting them the ketamine infusion. You know, if it works. That it's like, you know, it's like it's the first big thing, big change improvement in psychiatric treatment that's come along in a long time. Even SSRIs, you know, like now we know SSRIs don't work any better than psychotherapy or they don't even work any better than exercise. They don't even work any better than taking St. John's wort, which is an herbal formula, which does the same thing. It's, it's kind of also a sort of herbal SSRI, I guess. You know, I mean, so the SSRIs are really, even though they're prescribed really widely, there's lots of alternatives that just work just as well. Ketamine seems like, you know, almost like a wonder drug in some cases. Now, the long-term how long, how long the effects last in ketamine, that's still being studied. They're still trying to figure that out. They're trying to figure out if it'll still work with people with, with bipolar. There's some studies on it looking uh, with bipolar. All these are sort of like, you know, you haven't figured it out now. It's sort of a drug du jour. So you have to be careful that there's not a halo effect that people are, you know, talking about being this miracle thing. But it does seem to be really helpful with major depressive disorder, okay? especially with suicidality and things. So something you guys ought to know about, okay? Uh, uh, norfrin, I can't say this, buprenorphine and naloxone as a combination of medication consisting of a partial uh, opioid agonist, the buprenorphine, and the naloxone, which is a full opium agonist, which naloxone is the thing that now, by the way, just got um, uh, made over the counter. So you can buy, and now you can see it in nightclubs and things where people have opioid, or are gonna like, you know, have opioid overdoses. They can go to the 
break the you know, medicine chest, the emergency cabinet, take out an naloxone thing, give them a shot, naloxone, naltrexone, these are all same things, and then bring them out of the opioid thing. Because we have an opioid crisis in this country. You may not notice it around here as much, but if you were living in rural uh, Tennessee or rural West Virginia, you have whole communities where you have people just like opium addicts, opioid addicts everywhere, fentanyl addicts everywhere. Uh, they're putting fentanyl in all sorts of drugs. They're putting that really strong stuff. People are suddenly ODing, and so they're putting this naloxone everywhere. It's over the counter. Right? I just read somewhere, what was it? It was like a rock concert or someplace now they're going to have um, naloxone kits there just in case in nightclubs. They're going to have it there. People are ODing and can just go and give them a shot of it and, you know, Maybe it's a nasal spray, I can't remember. Um, but this is now um, out there. It's uh, it's over the counter now. You can get naloxone over the counter. Um, but they tried this with um, BPD people and it was found to decrease hospital admissions and number of contacts with crisis services, but it was just a single case study. Okay, so that doesn't tell you much. Possible that BPD is a disorder related to stress tolerance and self-soothing is mediated by this opioid system, as we saw in that diagram I showed you a while back ago. So maybe this is something you can start giving people naloxone with BPD. I don't know. Uh, at least there was one study done on it. So who knows? I would I would uh, hold off on that and, and wait and see what those are. Novel treatments for BPD. These I find very interesting. Repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which has been used to treat depression. Uh, and it is mixed. Result. You know what this is? You know how back in the day they gave people electroshock? That, and this is still a, a treatment for, uh, for treatment-resistant depression, SSRI, psychotherapy, nothing works on your depression. They take you in, they give you a zap. Now they do it, they give you muscle relaxants and they do a lower dose of voltage or whatever it is. Um, it's much more humane. Back in the day, it was not humane. People had convulsions to the point where they would break their own bones. It was, you know, and they would give them multiple treatments in one day, fry people's brains out. I have a whole lecture on this stuff sometime, um, which I'll love to give to you. I give it in the schizophrenia class on lobotomies and ECT and all sorts of things. Um, uh, but somebody realized that maybe it's not the electric field that is causing the, the improvement in depression. Maybe it is the magnetic field. And because, you know, magnetism and electricity are go together, right? And every time you generate current, you generate a magnetic field. If you have a magnetic field circulating around, you can generate current, right? That's how generators work, right? And, you know, that's how your car works. You've got a little magnet spinning around inside your generator or your alternator in the car and you're producing electric current, right? So this is how our modern society works, by the way. Very, very important thing that came around, you know, about the ninth, early 1900s, people started realizing this putting these things everywhere. So um, somebody probably got stuck in, somebody really depressed person probably went in for some other kind of procedure, got stuck in an MRI machine, which produces an intense magnetic field and came out and said, hey, I feel better. I told their doctor about it. She said, hey, wait a minute. Maybe we don't have to zap them in the brain. Maybe we just put them in a magnetic field, a strong magnetic field. And so they developed this transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's been mixed for depression. Some people it helps, some people it doesn't. Even though you go on Facebook, now I go on Facebook and I get like 20 ads for transcranial magnetic stimulation claiming that it'll cure depression. That's uh, the research study is not backing that up. It's the research is mixed. It's a great idea, um, but it's mixed right now. Maybe they need to figure out the frequency and then you tweak it a little bit better. Um, but they are trying this for a lot of other things. One thing they tried it for was borderline personality symptoms. And um the idea is that, again, you could affect the neural mechanisms involved in BPD, especially related to amygdala connectivity, right? Amygdala has to do with uh, your sense of fear, right? So that could have something to do with this stuff. And amygdala, you know, there's a lot of circuits in the brain go through the amygdala and then go out to other places. I assume you guys have had some neuroanatomy. You had neuroanatomy? Did they make you take a class in neuroanatomy here? Really? Huh? I'm a little jealous. I, I didn't, I never had that uh, as a graduate student. I had it as an undergrad because I was a biology major. So I took neuro, neuroanatomy, neurobiology as an undergrad, but I never had it as a graduate student. So I wish I hadn't got to take that. But um, yeah, cool. By the way, I told you guys you should all go and get some certification in neuropsychology, right? Can I tell you that? You have to do it when you're done because you don't have a track here. But you go to Fielding Graduate Institute when you're done and you get a they have a they have a, a respecialization in neuropsychology. Do that, highly recommend it. 
I think personally, I, I wish this program had a neuropsych track. It'd be very good for you guys as far as your career is concerned. A neuropsych track and a forensic track would be really great for this program. That's just my. You can get you can get internships and do those yeah. things, right? You have to learn. Back in the old days, we didn't have tracks in these things, so you had to just you just did just, you just kind of tailored your internships. Because I had students yeah. here who went and worked in prisons who wanted to be forensic psychologists. And so you know, I know I know people have done that, and that and that's you know that's that's the way you learn on the job. But some schools actually have specific tracks in this, like Alliant University Graduate School of Professional Psychology. They have tracks in forensics and neuroscience. And I think um, Chicago School has forensics, and uh, and Fielding has neuro neuropsych, and Fielding has a postgraduate neuropsych program too. Which is something to think about. Um, it's good to learn this stuff. I'm trying to learn it now, so I'm trying to get up on this stuff. So you guys can help me. Okay, another study used TMS applied to the DMPFC. You brain people, what does that stand for? Awesome. Dorsal menial prefrontal cortex, yes. Which is where? It is dorsal menial dorsal it's somewhere in the um, and uh, that said some efficacy. Okay, so again, these are small studies. Again, this is a great chance for a dissertation. Hook you up with somebody, one of these transcranial magnetic stimulation clinics. Get some BPD people in there, study them, see how it works. So put you on the map career-wise. So maybe a good thing to do. By the way, psychologists cannot administer transcranial magnetic stimulation. Only psychiatrists can do this. So this is another thing that, you know, and this is, this is not going to harm anybody. So this is another thing that psychologists probably ought to be pushing toward. I can imagine the day where you go into your therapy office and your patient sits down in a chair while you're facing them and you're talking to them. And while you're talking to them, a scanner, it scans their brain, shows up on a screen here, and you see their brain, what's working, what's not. You go, oh, I see this little thing here. Let me give you a little magnetic signal, press a button. And while they're sitting there doing their therapy, they get transcranial magnetic stimulation, and then they feel better when they move, right? It's probably in the future. Yes. I remember for a psychiatrist who did this. Yeah. Cancer license, non-cancer license, and he's mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, that's the problem right now. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem right now. But you know what will happen is that this will, you know, this will, um, this will come down. I mean, it's like it's like in medicine in general. My my physician was telling me the other day that he now has a um, there's a blood test to to, to um, that tests the precursors of cancer. You can get a blood test, and the blood test will tell you whether you're going to get cancer or you, or you have a you have you know you don't have a tumor yet or anything, but you're in risk for this kind of cancer. Right, and then they can start give you treatment early, right? And then, you know, you have cancer is the earlier you treat it, uh, the better the outcomes, right? So you think that's a fantastic thing. Insurance company ought to pay for it. They don't pay for it. You have to pay twelve hundred dollars out of pocket, you know, right? But you know, I mean, it's a matter of time that this will probably, you know. And likewise, if this can be shown to be, if the efficacy of this can be shown, then insurance companies will start paying for it. Okay. <clears throat> That's why somebody here ought to do a dissertation on this. You know, uh, it'd be interesting. And I can help you hook you up with people at the hospital too, if you wanted to, you know, if you need some help with it. You know, I, I could talk to them about it. Uh, other weird studies, not novel, not weird, novel treatments for BPD, Botox. They injected Botox into the glabular region. Anybody know what the glabular region is? Good brownie <laughs> points today, right here, right here, glabular region. Yes, very good. Right, you see it right here. Glabular <laughs> region. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. You guys, and they and they and they use as a control group. They use minimal acupuncture, just like a couple needles or something. Not this lady, but a couple needles acupuncture. Needles. And interestingly enough, they found that actually both the Botox and the acupuncture uh, reduced the symptoms. So is that something really going on or is that a placebo effect? Because they did not have a control group that got nothing um, or got it. They, they thought the acupuncture was going to be a sham treatment. But little do they know, acupuncture is actually really great at treating a lot of mental disorders. And um, I am working on a paper now with my friend who's an acupuncture doctor and I'm trying to um, look at the literature 
and find some case studies of using acupuncture with personality disorders. I can write a paper on this. Um, <clears throat> that's the idea. So uh, acupuncture can be really great for some things. Personally, I can tell you it's fantastic for depression. I'm going to get some acupuncture. So I was a dean of an acupuncture college for a while. So um, I have some experience. I was known as the human pincushion because the students would all practice on me. So if you think doing therapy with borderline personality disorder person is bad, try being the, the, the you know, the, the, the needling practice dummy for, you know, 100 acupuncture students. You know, that was the bad news. The good news was some of them were actually good. You could tell who was really good at it and who was not going to be good at it. Um, but acupuncture is something, again, um, you know, again, if you're thinking about referrals for things, it's something good to know about. And you should have in your program, in my opinion, again, I should take this out of the tape, there should be a course in alternative and complementary medicine. So you know who your colleagues are out there besides physicians and master's level people who are doing various things that could intersect with uh, psychological treatment, okay? And then know which ones you like and which ones you don't like. And also when your patients come and tell you they're seeing an acupuncturist, you'll have some idea of what that's about. If they're coming and telling you they're seeing a chiropractor, what's that about? And then you'll get a sense of which things you think are, you know, maybe have something to it and maybe something, things that you think are a little BS. You know, uh, there's a lot of stuff out there. People are getting, there's a lot of money Americans are spending on complementary and alternative medicine, tons. You should know a little bit about like vitamin industry, supplements, herbal medicine, all these kind of things. Some herbal medicines, like I mentioned, St. John's were very powerful antidepressant. Some studies have shown it working just as well as, you know, Xanax, you know, I mean, so you should know about that stuff. Um, so there should, you guys should have a class or it should be part of a class. I don't know, talk to the dean about that. I, I authored the class at Channel Islands. We have a class in Channel Islands, talk to the nurses. I was one of the authors of that class. Um, yeah, we teach it to nurses, the nurses, because they got to know about this stuff. You come in, you know, you have something wrong. They got to know, are you taking some weird herb or something that could have interactions with drugs? It could be something, you know, they need to know about that. Your physicians need to know about that. Psychologists need to know about that too. Because a lot of these alternative medicines will have psychoactive properties. Okay? And some are really helpful. I mean, I, in my experience, acupuncture is very, very helpful. And I have lots of an anecdotal stories about acupuncture doing tremendous good for people's psychological issues, at least the symptoms. Okay. So anyway, this is a study that showed that it actually helped. Differential diagnosis. We're gonna run out of time. We only have one paper today, right? And Michaela, yeah, Michaela's not here today, so she was gonna, yeah, okay. So let's try to leave a few minutes. God, I'm, I'm going to run out of time. Jeez, I tried to shorten this lecture up. Ah, sorry, um, I went off on some tangents. Uh, let's we'll, do, we'll get as much as we can done, and we'll just whatever I don't get done, we'll talk about next week because we're going to talk about antisocial personality disorder next week, and so some of the treatment stuff is going to be similar but not quite because you really can't treat people with antisocial personality disorder. So that part will be shorter, so we can cover what we don't get to today. Yeah, but I want to make sure we have time for your paper. Okay. Uh, differential diagnosis. Uh, a couple things you need to be concerned about. ADHD, about 15% of uh, ADHD sufferers also diagnosed with BPD. Overlapping symptoms include emotional regulation, impulse control. Bipolar often occurs with BPD. Uh, some researchers believe that BPD is a variation of bipolar disorder. Uh, leads to more treatment with second generation antipsychotics because they're using that with bipolar now. Um, it could also the other bipolar meds, those anti-convulsants I meant before, those are newer things that are being used for bipolar. Um, if psychotherapy helps, then they probably have BPD, and if meds help, probably bipolar. One kind of quick rule of thumb, not, not precise or exact, but that's kind of a rule of thumb you can think of. BPD may also be confused with major depression, schizophrenia, post-traumatic stress. Uh, since BPD is a result of childhood trauma, in most cases, PTSD should probably be diagnosed along with it. There's a lot of overlap, okay? Of course, a great amount of overlap with cluster, other cluster B disorders, narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, should also include histrionic and um, dependent personality disorder there as well. Also, cluster A and cluster C disorders can overlap, uh, especially obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Uh, Bipolar personality disorder and dissociative identity disorder, as I mentioned before, may be on the same pathological spectrum and be distinguished by the amount of dissociation. 
people with BPD don't have alters. They just see you as good or bad, right? Um, one study could not distinguish these disorders, however, they used the MMPI to measure these kind of things, and they could not measure the dissociation. They could not distinguish them between you when they use the MMPI. Very interesting. Um, autism spectrum disorder can be confused with BPD and vice versa. Both disorders present challenges in interpersonal functioning. BPD uh, can show many autistic traits. And lots of research on this. I cited there for you. You can look into these if you're interested. And this is a thing I ran across looking at the overlapping features of bipolar and um, uh, show you that. Now we're not going to have time to go in this, but I but I put this slide up. I think hopefully you can these links will work in your PDF. If they do not, let me know and I will post these. But I thought you guys might really enjoy hearing um, Dr. Kernberg talk about BPD and a couple, these are really short videos, like three to five minutes. And you can just listen to him talk. I think it's really worthwhile. I mean, he's very eloquent. You know, I'm telling you this stuff, but when you hear it from him, he says it much better than me. Also, Frank Yeomans is a guy who talks about the difference between borderline and narcissism. And he, he talks in terms of attachment style, so interesting attachment style. And then I put in some psychiatric interviews uh, that are done, just sort of general therapists, just interviewing people with BPD and talking about that. So these are longer, but they're kind of interesting if you want to like get some examples of, of you know, working with a BPD person. Higher function BPD people. And I thought you guys might like this. Psychotherapy for BPD, very quickly. Kernberg says there are three approaches to psychotherapy for BPD, supportive, modified, expressive, psychodynamic, and classic psychoanalysis. He tends toward the latter two. Uh, supportive therapy, however, later, later, his later stuff, he's, he's much more integrative with supportive therapy, supportive therapy, things like CBT and DBT and things like that. Um, he's much more uh, later on, more recently, he's really talked much more about integrating, doing more integrative therapy. Okay? And he thinks that supportive therapy is helpful, but the patient will need to continue the therapy indefinitely. So people who have really severe borderline personality disorder may not have a capacity for reflection and be able to develop it. And so they just may need supportive therapy, just dealing with the symptoms that may, they may need that the rest of their life. And that's okay, you know, if that helps them. Okay? Minority of BPD patients will benefit from classical psychoanalysis. Uh, my dad has done a lot of um, uh, classical psychoanalysis with BPD patients. Um, and we'll talk about that on the last day when we talk about his book on the six steps to treatment of the borderline uh, personality disorder. And I will tell you how he differs from Kernberg in that my dad believes that, you, that the patient needs to regress completely almost to a psychotic state and then build up their development. Uh, not just to take them where they are and build them up. But they have to regress first. That's the big difference in my dad's approach. Otherwise, he's pretty similar to Kernberg. Okay. BPD patients have severe difficulties in interpersonal relationships, but usually have good reality testing. They're defended against chaotic, primitive, unconscious contents and can manifest a pseudo insight of their personalities while not being aware of the conflicts and lack of identity of other people. So that's something you've got to be aware of. They're showing insight in therapy. You've got to worry, is it real insight or is it pseudo insight? Very important to, to figure that out. Defenses are primitive. You have splitting, projection, projective identification, and dissociation. Um, and ego weaknesses, impulsivity, uh, inability to tolerate anxiety. And that one, inability to tolerate anxiety is very important in therapy because you don't want to like make them too anxious because they're going to run away. Okay? Uh, inability to sublimate or plan for the future. Some primary process, illogical, magical thinking related to oral, aggressive, and libidinal content. Um, they have distinguishing, difficulty distinguishing self from others, identity diffusion, boundary issues, difficult integrating aggressive and libidinal aspects into their self-image. Transference and reality are confused. Another thing very important to therapy. Analyst becomes the early transference object because of primitive projection. They will make you into their early parent. And the reality of that, they're not able to interpret the transference. That they're not able to readily see that you are not that person, right? That takes a while. Um, therapists can't be seen as their own person, but only in terms of the transference, which rapidly shifts. This can also lead to transference psychosis, where you know, they, they're so diffuse that they it becomes a little bit psychotic. Like they, they relate to you like a psychotic person might relate to you. Transference becomes intense in therapy. can rapidly become more important to the patient than the rest of his or her life. The therapy, you know, the transference is very, very intense. This is also a good sign. 
Um, it's because the transference uh, satisfies a primitive pathological need and acting out in therapy, but it also means that you are now, if, if there's really intense transference, then you've got something you can work with. Okay? And so that actually can be a good thing. Limit setting, you essentially have to contract with the patient not to act out in the session as much as possible in his or her everyday life, necessary to prevent, uh, not prevent, to protect the therapist neutrality. That's a bad typo, I gotta fix that. Um, okay, protect the therapist neutrality. Um, also, uh, if the patient cannot form the contract, then that's the reason why they may not be good candidates for psychotherapy, for, for, for psychodynamic psychotherapy for borderline personality disorder. If they can't limit set, then maybe they just need to be doing something supportive and deal with symptoms. Um, you know, that's, that, that's just some prognosis for the therapy. 